This is Deandra Beatty, and you're listening to The Bowler Show. Hi, this is Jackie Bowling, and you're listening to The Bowler Show. This is Jeff Riggles of Storm Products and TheEleventhFrame.com. You're listening to The Bowler Show. Hi, this is EJ Tackett, and you're listening to The Bowler Show. This is Dave Lamont, and you're listening to The Bowler Show. Tonight, we're joined by newly elected PBA Hall of Famer and owner of one of the most memorable moments in PBA history, Pete McCordick. Next, we'll be speaking to another freshly minted member of the Hall, legendary coach, teacher, proprietor, and author, Fred Borden. After that, we'll be switching gears and getting to know more about Jim Cripps, famously known as the backwards bowler, who just shot the first 300 with that style. Finally, we'll be joined by PWBA member, multiple medalist for Team Mexico, and creator and CEO of Volat Athletics, Sandra Gangora. And now your hosts, David the Waz Wazwo and Luke Rosal. All right, welcome one, welcome all to another sh- exciting sh- show of The Bowler Show, the edition of The Bowler Show, I should say. And a programming note to start here, Luke, as you know, unfortunately, Sandra Gangora has uh, fallen ill and will not be able to make the show here at 7.30. So unless we just have a random person that's watching the show wants to come on, we will probably just cut it off uh, after uh, when, when her segment comes out. Unfortunately, um, I saw that she was sick earlier in the week. I, she was hoping to get better by this time. But yeah. uh, unfortunately, it did not happen. Uh, she has agreed to come on her our next show. So hopefully uh, things will go better and she'll feel better and we'll get her on. Um, before we start also, let's uh, go ahead and thank all of our sponsors here. Uh, of course, we wouldn't be on the show without Storm Bowling. I want to thank them first and foremost. Uh, we are also brought to you by I Am Bowling, Cool Wick, Turbo Grips, SRG, BBFS, Storm mm-hmm. Roto Grip Bowling Balls for Sale, uh, Bobby J's, BobbyJackson's.com, Double J's Pro Shop, s Custom Homes, Bowlers Mart, and Luke, unless I'm missing uh, something on your shirt there you don't have... No. Yeah, it's 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 in here. It's all in here somewhere, but it, it's a little chilly in the basement. So, I believe I believe that was everybody's. Yeah, so. yeah, I think yeah. Um, anything going on in your world you want to talk about before we start the show? Uh, yeah, it's been busy. Uh, we had a pretty busy weekend, so I'm gonna lay low a little bit this <laughs> this <laughs> show. But uh, we did have a very successful uh, annual fundraiser and year end recap for. Uh, local rescue here in Kansas City. We raised uh, $6,500 is what we got the total to, a little over that. So that was great. We got a, Now we got a bunch of prizes to uh, to order and ship out to everybody. So we'll be busy for a little while doing that. But it was a, it was a, a successful night. And then, of course, there's the regular, uh, regular YouTube stuff and all that to kind of... We spent a lot of time at the bowling alley this morning filming for some more videos. So... Yeah, uh, you and I, you and I have a lot going on in the bowling world other than yeah, yeah. the bowler show. So uh, we'll, we'll kind of talk about that a little bit later, maybe at the end of the show. Yeah, it's, uh, it's it's quite a burden to do all this. I know you, you know you. I think it's called a full time job. You have one of those also. Yeah, yeah, I have one of those things that I at least I at least show up to from. For... Takes a, it takes a, a little bit of your time. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Angel's put in the chat six thousand five hundred and ninety five was your. Th- Final number uh, yep. for the uh, positive, positive yeah, tails. Is that positive, is yeah, positive tails and pause crossed, and then uh, um, they had a uh, something called Giving Tuesday, where there was a a group that was willing to double whatever was whatever was put in. So wow. we actually took two thousand bucks and turned that into four thousand. So wow. So it ended up being yeah, a total eighty five hundred dollars. So just kind of a fortunate thing to have that going on while we were doing what we were doing. Oh, that's awesome, man. That's, that's, that's good yeah. stuff. I know you guys do a great job with that. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, all three of your dogs are, are from shelters, correct? Yep. They're all, yeah, they're all from a, two of them are from Paws Crossed. And then the latest one that we have is from Positive Tales. And we actually fostered, I think seven or eight dogs for Positive Tales. And this is a, uh, this is a time of the year where people get puppies for Christmas and then they realize, you know, because you know, puppies for Christmas, cute, it's a great idea. And then, you know, a couple of weeks later, they figure out that they're work. And they, so they have uh, middle of January, they usually uh, shelters, rescues, whatever else get slammed with a bunch of Christmas puppies uh, that people didn't realize what breed they were getting or don't 
don't want to end up taking care of them or, or whatever. So this is this is why we do it at, at this time of the year to kind of give them a little bit of cash flow going into the going into the holidays. All right. Well, enough about us. Enough uh, enough stumbling around about our 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 week and our bowling and stuff like that. The Bowler Show is for the bowlers. Yep. And uh, let's go ahead and talk about our first guest. He. He joined the PBA first in 1973, not quite as far back as uh, Carmen Salvino from a couple of weeks ago, but he joined in 1973. Of course, he's a PBA Titleist. As you said, he's on the, I believe it's in the top 10 memorable moments of all time. I, on the I think PBA. it was number four. Yeah, I got ranked number four, the, the fourth most memorable moment in PBA history. And the most memorable moment for him recently was in being inducted into the PBA Hall of Fame. So let's go ahead and bring him on. His name is Pete McCordick. Pete, welcome to the Bowler Show. Thanks, thanks, guys, for having me. Uh, not sure I've ever been compared to the same age as Carmen Salvino or anything, but hey, that's that's kind of an honor too, I guess. You know, so it's okay. <laughs> well, be before we go any further, at, at what point did you cross with Carmen Salvino? Many years, in fact. Uh, you know, I first went out on tour in 1973. I was 19 years old. Uh, wasn't quite ready yet. Went out full time in '75. But Carmen was still bowling and very active then, and and in, in a lot of ways he he uh, was almost a mentor. He he helped me some. He, he tried to help me some with my bowling a little bit, with the equipment I was using. He was involved with developing bowling balls and things like that. Um, so yeah, I I knew Carmen very well, and I consider Carmen a friend. Not, I wish I could have known him better. Even uh, you know, we we never. It's not like we went out to dinner every weekend or anything like that, but he, he, he was a, a great man and a great friend to me while I was out there. Yeah. yeah. He's, he's been fun to have on the show. He's got a million stories as you know, and uh, you know, we could spend an hour or two with him easily and just, just let him go to be perfectly honest. And, and he's so gracious and he, you know, he's, he's just a, he was a showman, but he also understands the, you know, the history of the game and, and what, guys like himself you know when the, when the pba first started what what they meant to the game and even even now to this day at age 89 you know people still look back and think about carmen salvino when they link sure. exactly and uh one thing that you did not ever want to do is try to get the last word with carmen salvino because <laughs> it was just not going to happen so it was uh uh he was great jester and uh great conversationalist so i can't imagine what you guys did on the radio with him <laughs> Yeah, he, he was great. So, all right. Well, we talked about your PBA Hall of Fame induction. Uh, you had another induction here just just before that. Uh, you, we were talking a little bit about the PBA Southwest Region also inducted you into their, their Hall of Fame. Let's start with that. Let's talk talk a little bit about that. Sure. Um, I was appointed Southwest Region Director in '97. Uh, took over then for Cecil Cadell, who had had it for many years. Uh, throughout the years, it just seemed to me like each region should have their Hall of Fame. I mean, the regional uh, tour was created for uh, people that couldn't bowl on the national tour due to jobs or families or something like that. And there are a lot of great players that bowled in the regional competition that just never had the chance to go out on the tour. So, um, so with the help of uh, the Grand Casino and Chris Gillings in, in uh, Shawnee, Oklahoma, uh, we created the PBA Southwest Region Hall of Fame. Uh, we've we've put some great players into that, including Chris Barnes and Wes Malott, who were inducted into that Hall of Fame before the PBA Hall of Fame, as well as other players like Henry Gonzalez um, that, that won 25 tournaments, uh, Mike Scroggins, who won 30-something tournaments before he became a, a great player on the PBA National Tour. So it... it to me, I, I think the region really appreciates having the Hall of Fame. I had nothing to do with putting myself in. And, and when my successor to my position with the Southwest region uh, notified me, it was a great honor that, that they thought enough of me to uh, add me to their Hall of Fame. And, and that ceremony took place last weekend in the PBA Southwest region Invitational, which is also the only region that has an Invitational tournament for their top uh, players throughout the year. Um, just another great event, great uh, thing for the PBA Southwest region, and uh, I was happy to be part of it. And, you know, every region thinks they've got the toughest region and the best group of bowlers, but I don't, I don't think there's too many people 
that would doubt that the Southwest region here in the past 10 years or, or even longer, you know, it, it's almost like a tour event each time out there uh, for the players. Talk, talk a little bit about your region and how strong it's been over the years. It, well, it's been strong throughout the uh, history of the PBA, starting from uh, back when Gary Dickinson was involved in, in Bold. Uh, uh, in fact, he won the first Southwest region uh, regional event. You know, he's a PBA Hall of Famer. Um, guys from our region, such as Del Ballard, and and I, I, man, if I go, if I start doing this and leave people out, it's going to be horribly embarrassing. But throughout the years, it's, it has been great players throughout the region. Bobby Cooper was Rookie of the Year. Some of our Rookie, the, he won the U.S. Open. Um, you know, Bobby Meadows, John Denton, uh, Philip Ringer won titles. Just and if you go through, and then you get to the Hall of Famer guys like Wes Mallott, um, Chris Barnes. You know, Anthony Simonson, who, who grew up in the Texas area, he's, he's been a big part of it. And the thing that really helps the Southwest region is, is a lot of these players that bowl on the tour, and, and they got started in the Southwest region, bowling regional events, and they continued to bowl the regional events. I, I know whenever I was trying to get tournament host, um, they wanted to know if any of the named players would be there, the tour players. So these guys supporting the regional events really made it worthwhile for the proprietors to have PBA regional events, as well as for the players to bowl some of the against some of the PBA Hall of Famers, uh, even though obviously you're not going to be very successful against them. But when you did beat them, it meant something to you. So there, all the players in the Southwest region that has success on the tour, um, as well as the regional program, it, it just helped make everything better for the PBA Southwest region and the PBA. Well, that's great. It sounds like it would have been a great region to bowl. Unfortunately, here in the Midwest, we're stuck with John Weber and Toby Contreras. So <laughs> two good guys. I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> because, because we care. They do a great job here, too. Of course, the Weber. Can, 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 can you send me a tape of that part of the tournament? I want to forward <laughs> that to John Weber just uh, for future references whenever I get to kid him about stuff. John, John, John's a good guy and he's a good friend. And obviously in the Midwest, we've had Weber's, you know, running that region forever. So sure. uh, I don't want to get in his bad graces. So I think Luke, <laughs> Luke, if you can hear me, cut that, cut that out when you get a chance. Uh, send me the original, please. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, well, let's move on from the Southwest region. You, you're, you're, uh, you're doing your duties down there and all of a sudden uh, you get a phone call. I'm not sure how this happened. Take us through the, what happened, how you found out, that you were going to be inducted into the PBA Hall of Fame? Uh, well, it probably started back in April. I, I officially resigned from the PBA um, in April, and uh, it was just time. It was just time for me to, to resign and all that. I wanted to bowl a little bit more competitively. So, um, it, like I said, there, there was a thousand reasons, none of them bad toward the PBA or anything. It was just – Totally, I felt like it was time to hand it off to uh, somebody else, and, and I feel very fortunate that they chose Tony Lanning. I think he'll do a great job. So after that, I did start bowling a little bit more. Um, <clears throat> I, had, I had bowled decent in the Senior Masters and the Super Senior Classic. I finished third this year, and I wanted to go out on the PBA Senior Tour. I didn't bowl as well out there as I, as I wanted in, at the end of the summer. But Ron Moore has his senior events in November, and I went, I bowled at the, the 15 over tournament. I didn't do as well as I wanted. Uh, in fact, I, I think it was the first day of the super senior tournament, maybe the second day. Um, I had a bad day. Oh, it must have been a 15 over tournament. So I had a bad day. Um, I thought I got a super senior check, and I, I had a call from Tom Clark earlier in the day, and uh, I, I couldn't get to it because I was bowling. Then he called again, and I gave the phone to my wife, and I said, hey, look, Tom Clark's calling me. I don't know why. Uh, can you call him? Just let him know I'm bowling right now. I'll call him afterwards. So uh, she gave, you know, she said, hey, call him after 4 o'clock or something. And, and uh, so he called me again, and, and he said, well, how's it going, Pete? And I said, Tom, I said, I'm bowling. I'm enjoying the bowling. I just don't feel like I'm doing as well as I could. I think I just missed a check. Hopefully I get a super senior check, uh, but at least I get to be bowling. So it's not all bad. And he says, well, uh, let me make your day a little bit better here. I mean, we talked for five or 10 minutes about things and, you know, they had tried to do a ruse to get me on a, a corporate call with a bunch of the regional directors and other people. But Due to uh, me bowling this tournament or that tournament, uh, I was just unavailable for the call. 
So he said, you know, we really didn't really, uh, they, they told you we wanted your input on some regional tournaments or the tour for 2023, uh, but that's not the reason for the call. Um, he said, uh, you've been selected to be in the PBA Hall of Fame. And obviously just saying that, I get emotional just saying that. I, I just, it was, it was a total, total shock to me that that could happen. And, and like I said, I get chills now just thinking about it. Um, I knew performance wise, I didn't have the credentials uh, to get in it for, for performance. Um, Gary Mage had gotten into the PBA Hall of Fame for meritorious service uh, the year or two before that. But he was regional director for 44 years. Uh, wow. I wasn't going to do it for 44 years. So, you know, I, I knew that. And, uh, you know, I, I just never put, I never thought it even possible that this would happen. So when Tom told me that, I got uh, pretty emotional just on the phone. Thankfully, there weren't a lot of people around. And I was basically mute for three or four minutes. It, it, it's just been uh, an unbelievable honor that 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 I still can't believe is happening. And uh, but I'm, I'm very honored by it, and uh, just uh, can't wait for the rest of the experience. And and uh, wow, you know, just wow. What else can you say? You know, wow. So uh, I'm very grateful for the selection. Yes. All right. And uh, when is the rest of the experience experience? When is the, the ceremony? March 12th, uh, the Sunday prior to the start of the PBA Tournament of Champions. OK. And, and your other inductees, Lenny Borsch and Fred Borden, you have any any uh, stuff stuff with them? Any any contact with them over the years? Um, obviously, I bowled some against Lenny. I mean, I don't think Lenny was uh, as full time on the tour back when I was. And then he, he he was a great player then. He always had great USBC tournaments and things like that. So I didn't really know him so much on, going on the PBS National Tour. Once he turned 50, he went on the PBA Senior Tour, and he's been very successful there. I mean, he had success on the PBS National Tour tournaments when he bowled, but I just don't think he was uh, a full-time for a long time or for very many years. So we just think I, I didn't know him that well, but, yeah, I've always respected him. He's a great player. Uh, Freddie Borden, you know, obviously one of the, the best coaches at, uh, uh, of bowling for many years. Uh, I, I first met Freddie when I was 19 years old. I was a uh, rookie on tour and we stopped by to, to see him. And, uh, you know, I, I don't want to give a preview of my one of my speeches that I'm, or part of my speech that I'm planning for March 12th. So uh, just just say it was a great experience meeting Freddie at that at that time in my life. And uh, I, I'm happy for him and, and uh, uh, both of them very much deserve that they're in the PBA Hall of Fame, uh, Lenny and, and Freddie Borden for, for their own accomplishments. All right. Well, the reason a lot of people listened in, they, they don't care anything about your Hall of Fame stuff. They, they want to talk <laughs> about the 300. I'm sure this is a topic that people, you know, bring up all the time. And I'm sure you're happy to talk about, it. obviously it's one of the most memorable moments. Uh, on the PBA tour in history, so I, I don't even know where to begin. Let, let's let's begin with this. I, I always like seeing the old time three hundred. I call it old time. I'm old too. So the the three hundred from the thrilling days of yesteryear because you see guys like uh, Mark Gerber, it's Kevin Shippey, uh, John Jowdy out on the approach with you. Talk a little bit about the the tenth frame. I know everybody wants to say, you know, what were you thinking? I'm sure you know during the time you were just that, focusing on your own stuff, but Tell us what you remember about the 10th frame and, and the, the aftermath. Uh, you know, I did, it really doesn't seem like it was that many years ago. I did, there's not every, I, I can't say I remember everything about it, uh, but there were a few things that happened. Uh, it was a very close game. I mean, Wayne Webb was still bowling a, a great game. Um, I think he went spare strike spare the first three frames. Um, I started with a string of, five, six in a row. And I remember throwing one shot on the left lane. It was like two boards left of my target and it went straight in the pocket. And I said, well, I think I have a, I have a good enough reaction to shoot 300. Just one of those quick things that you think in your head, but you don't even think about it being possible at, at that early stage of it. Um, and then uh, Webb kept striking and, and in the ninth, in the 10th frame, I'm sorry, he left a solid nine pin, I think. 
and wow, I just, uh, you know, I, I kind of dropped my head, said a layer, little prayer, uh, got up in the 10th frame, and uh, first shot was, I nailed it. I mean, it was pure, and I think that helped relax me a little bit, um, even though it didn't look like it on TV because everybody always talks about how nervous I was. <clears throat> But I think it, in, in a lot of ways, it did relax me. I, I threw that 10th frame perfect. The 11th shot, I lost a little bit off my hand, and even Bo said something about that, uh, and, it, and it struck. And then uh, the 10th frame, or the 12th shot, the final shot, um, a, a lot of things were happening throughout this. Ever since, uh, like, the 6th or 7th frame, Larry Lickstein sitting in the, in the settee areas back then, and, and he was our player of service guy. And he'd, hadn't, he'd been player of service for many years. And the thing that people don't really realize is um, Jim Stefanich, it had been 14 years since Jim Stefanich had had his 300 game on TV. And so every time people started with a string of strikes, uh, they would start mentioning it and all that. So there was more pressure than just a normal 300 game, uh, or even, even though the 100 grand was there, and that was huge even though I can't really say I was thinking about it at the time, but it was just so long and nobody had done it. And I just remember Larry Lichten was a big part of this. He just kept saying, Pete, you can do this. Pete, you can do this. Ever since like the seventh or eighth frame, he must have said that 25 times, you know, wow. in the last four or five frames. And the 12th shot, in all honesty, I, I thought I tugged it again. I, I thought I tugged it again. And, uh, you know, I still think the good Lord stuck his hand down there. Held it in the pocket, 10, 10 pins went down. I raised my hands and wow, you know, cool. Yeah. So that was uh that, that was an amazing thing. It was uh uh just yeah, yeah, just blessing. It was it was awesome. Yeah. And people say, Do you do you realize how nervous you were when you shot? I said, well, yeah, kind of. I was there, you know. Oh, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. So that was uh, that's the Reader's Digest version. I, I I could write a book about the whole game probably sometime, but you know that was uh, the quick ex ex explanation of the the last game. And uh, I, I believe it was a black U dot. You still have that ball somewhere? Actually, and not everybody knows this. There were two balls. I was using two black U dots. Yeah. Um, and if, and if you got time for another story about that. Uh, uh, you take as long as you need. <laughs> Seriously. I, I was uh, the right lane. I had a, a really good reaction on the right lane with, with the ball. I, I went down there to practice. And back in those days, you got 30 minutes practice on that pair before the TV show. Uh, the left lane was obviously, to me, just a little bit different. You know, and the, the same ball I used on the right lane. Uh, just didn't didn't work as good on the left lane. So Goose came down, our tournament director back then, and he said, Pete, five more minutes, uh, five more minutes till airtime. I said, geez, I, I don't like the, the look I have on the left lane. So I did run up to the, the paddock, and at Gable House back then, the locker room was upstairs and all that. So I had to run up a flight of stairs to get this uh, other ball that I thought might work, ran back down, sweat's already pouring down my face because the lights were a little warmer back then. Um, I threw the, uh, the ball I went up to get. I threw it once on the left lane, and it struck. Uh, Goose said two more minutes, and I threw it once on the right lane, and it just didn't react. Threw out a left lane one more time, and it struck. And Goose said, okay, airtime. And, uh, you know, they, uh, uh, they, uh, so I, I, I said, well, what do I do? I said, well, I said, this ball strikes on this lane so far, and this ball strikes on that lane so far. I'll start with two different balls. And, and uh so that's that's what happened with that. Um, so yes, I do have one of the two balls in my possession. It's in my office. Um, John Jowdy, uh, who was with Columbia, ball rep with Columbia, who was always very gracious, very helpful to me in my career, coaching wise, um, equipment wise, anything I needed. Uh, John was always there for me too. Um, I gave him the other ball. He's uh, said Columbia had a kind of a. Uh, um, museum type uh, showcase at Columbia 300 in San Antonio at the time. So I gave him that ball for that. Um, in all honesty, I don't know what's ever happened to that because I know that there was a fire at that plant and then I know Ebonite has bought Columbia. So I, I have no idea what, where that ball is, but I do have the other ball that I use for the 300 game in my office. And that one's hopefully will never be burned up or anything like that. 
No, that's that's a great story. That, like I said, I I remember that now, but I had forgotten just once once you came on the show here, I'd forgotten about that, and you know, just little nuances like that. I mean, you know, well, first of all, when you talk about goose, you're you're meaning Harry Gold, and a lot of people may or may not know who you're who you're talking about there. But the two different balls, real quick, without getting too deep into it, because back then it was you know finger weight, thumb weight, and side weight. What? How were they different? Uh, the main difference was the one on the right lane had a little bit more polish on it, and the one on the left lane was more of a box finish and, and hadn't had any polish on it. Uh, the ball in the right lane did have a bigger access point hole or weight hole, leverage weight that we, you know, there was leverage weight, access weight, and, you know, then, like you say, top weight, side weight, yeah. all that kind of stuff. Uh, so there was a bigger hole in the one on the right lane with the polish and a little bit smaller hole in the left. Uh, one on the left lane, but mainly it was just the uh, cover stock. The, the one on the left lane was was had more of a uh, dull finish. The one on the right lane had shinier finish. All right, well, you crossed with obviously some of the best bowlers in the world uh, for many years. T- take a moment and maybe pick one or or two or whatever you need to talk about some of the guys you really either were friends with or really enjoyed crossing with. You know, um, it. it and I thought about this uh, uh, recently, you know, who did I enjoy crossing with? Um, and, and and nothing sticks out. I mean, there were so many great players on the PBA tour at the time, you know, um, and, and 98% of them were great guys. So uh, if we bowl together, then um, it, it was, you remember more of the guys you didn't want to cross with than the guys you wanted to cross with or that were good to cross with. Because, uh, like I said, most of the guys were just great guys. Um, especially it, it, once you became a champion of the tour, they kind of limited uh, who you cross with as far as other champions. So a lot of the times, uh, since once I became a champion, I got to cross with guys who hadn't won before, and I, I tried to remember what it was like when I went out on tour and what it was like to bowl with these guys. So. Um, Having a favorite guy to cross with, and uh, I, I, I'm not sure I could do that. And please don't ask me about the guys I didn't want to cross with. <laughs> I'll just put them all in in one group. If they took forever and weren't ready to bowl, I did not like crossing with them. You know? So uh, please just be ready to bowl when it's your turn and bowl. Uh, other than that, that's uh, I think I better leave it at that. <laughs> That's good stuff. I, I will not pinpoint you on that. I'll, I'll just ask. Now nah, I won't even ask that. So <laughs> thank you. <laughs> we'll just we'll just leave that one alone. So, um, really, I mean, uh, you know, you've gone through your career. You you've you've been in the, the region working uh, for many years. Uh, what's what's Pete McCordick doing right right now nowadays? Um, you know, when I was still working, a lot of people asked me that. What are you going to do when you retire? And I. My, my stock answer was whatever I want, as long as my wife allows me to. So, uh, you know, but ba- in, in reality, uh, I did start bowling more. Um, that was one of the reasons that I, wa- I wanted to retire. I mean, it's just a, a matter of life that, I, that we're all getting older. And as we get older, it's harder to compete. And I still felt like I wanted to compete a little bit. Uh, well, I, I did want to compete before I, I knew it was inevitable that I wasn't going to be competitive. So so I'm trying to stay in shape, trying to, to practice a little more, trying to bowl a little bit. I plan on bowling uh, quite a few of the PBA 50 tournaments coming up this year. Um, you know, I'm spending a lot of time at home, a lot of time with my wife, some time with my family. Uh, you know, I, I do play golf more and uh, I didn't think I would enjoy that. And the way I play golf, it's hard to enjoy, you know, but I, I'm trying to make an effort at that. And, uh, you know, but other than that, it's just uh, uh, just relaxing and, and reading books, doing doing whatever I want when I want to do it. So but bowling is still a big part of it. Um, I, I do practice a lot. I, I practice with my brother a lot. We spend more time together now probably than uh, we have in, in years. So. Uh, just, just a lot of good things. It's just a lot of good things. All right, uh, Luke, you got anything for, for Pete before we let him go? Yeah, hopefully this isn't too long of a – I like asking long, long questions with long <laughs> answers. But um, I, I like going back and watching a lot of the old shows because there was a whole lot more 
or there, there was a whole lot less structure to it. I mean, they didn't know as much, you didn't have lane machines and you didn't have all these bunch of different bowling balls to manage. And, um, you know, so it was more down to just the bowler having that sixth sense and the ability to knock over the pins. It was you versus the lane, and um, there, there wasn't so much extra stuff to help, I guess, as far as technology goes. So throughout the kind of course of your career, what are some of the changes slash improvements to bowling that, uh, that you've really liked, that you thought have been good for the game, and what are some of the things that, you know, conversely you wish might, might not have been a thing? <laughs> well, um, that's kind of, let me separate between selfishly and unselfishly, what I think is, is good or bad. Uh, you know, obviously, selfishly, I, I, I think the, the people that, that can create the 500 rev rate effortlessly with a lot of speed, that should be outlawed. I mean, that's just not fair that guys can do that, you know. It's yeah, just, yeah. You know but it... it in all honesty, that's it's amazing what they can do to it, you know. So uh, you can't you can't blame them for for uh, creating greatness in things that we just never even thought of. But but saying that and what leads up to that, and one of the things I think is great about bowling now, uh, and something that I'm not as good at that I need to get better at, is the amount of knowledge that is available now to bowlers, whether they're beginner bowlers, high school bowlers, college players. There's just so much more knowledge out there that we didn't have. I mean, it, I, I almost feel uh, inadequate to give instructions now because I, I'm more of an old school fundamental type player. And, and basically that's what I still know, you know, so I, I am behind on the knowledge part of it, but there is so much knowledge out there that's available to the players. I think that's a great thing. I mean, there's, there's knowledge on the lane conditions, how to play the lane conditions on the equipment, how to drill the equipment, what different equipment does. Um, and, and I think that's just an opportunity for, for uh, anybody young or old to, to uh, learn about the game and, and to get better. Hope that answered your that's, long question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's great. Good stuff. It's all uh, Luke, Luke is, is Fred in the, in the queue right now? Yep. Uh, do you want to bring him on real quick and uh, Fred and, and Pete can talk for a moment? Sure. All right. Also being inducted in the PBA Hall of Fame this week is uh, probably the most known coach in the in the history of bowling. Uh, his name is Fred Borden. Fred, welcome to the show and uh, welcome to the chat with Pete. Well, it's great to be here and it's really good to see Pete. I haven't seen him in a few years. You know, he's, he's such a gentleman and uh, probably better bowler than he ever thought he was. You know, he uh, <laughs> he was a shot maker. He was a real yeah. shot maker and a very precision type player. But more than all that, he's just a good guy, a good guy to hang out with, a good guy to be around. And uh, he was uh, just fun to hang out with and, and watch that ball go down the lane. And then we'd talk a little bit over the years. And it was uh, it was fun times, Pete. I enjoyed that. And how, how, here we are, how many years later, uh, going in the same night and Akron, Ohio, in, in my hometown, it's uh, going to be a special day. Oh, I, t I tell you, Fred, it is uh, it is definitely a special thing. And, uh, you know, uh, congratulations to you on being selected. It's, it's an honor to be put into the Hall of Fame at the same time as you. Uh, uh, yeah, it's unbelievable. And, and I just smile and get goosebumps every time I think about it. But congratulations to you. Thank you for everything you've done for bowling, for PBA, uh, to help me throughout the years. I, I really appreciate all that. Uh, can't thank you enough for that, too. Thanks, Pete. What's well, guys like you that got me in the Hall of Fame? <laughs> well, there's a story about that. I'm going to yeah. tell that at the Hall of Fame. Yeah. Well, you know what? When you talk to people and you say, well, I went and got a lesson with Coach Borden. Well, that's why. I'm here because of the players, not because of me. It's because of the time with the players. And I have a little saying that I've used for years, and I – I sort of like it. You know, it's what we learn after we know it all that really counts. That's number one. I'm still learning. And Definitely. number two is it, it don't take long to tune up a Rolls Royce. And I got the opportunity to work with all the Rolls Royces of the game, yourself and Carmen Salvino, and, and it goes on and on, the number of people. And, uh, you know, when you ask them to do something, they could do it. And uh, it was fun. It used to awe me. I would I'd look back and say, wow, this guy can just do that in four shots. That's amazing. 
Well, you know, well I made Tesh on that, Freddie. I made both the uh, tournament of champions after our Hall of Fame thing. I may need 10 or 15 minutes with you to, to give me sharp again. Let's make sure we do that. See, I'd enjoy that again. <laughs> Live the old time back in. And you know what? You said a mouthful a little while ago. And the big, heavy core bowling balls and the coefficient of friction, and the coefficient of restitution is how hard the ball hits the pins. When you can throw it 19 to 20 miles an hour, you can create pin action. Well, we couldn't throw the bowling balls that had the old pancake weight blocks in them. They, if you threw them that hard, they'd just sail 65 feet right into the pit. So you had to throw it about 16 and a half, 17. So if I have one message for all the older peoples, move up on the approach, take quicker, faster steps and throw that thing harder. But don't change your game, just change your adjustments. You know, there's five adjustments in our sport, the angle, ball, loft, speed, releases. And it equals about 810 combinations when you understand that it's six bowling balls times five angles. Well, that's 30 combinations right there. You know, times three lofts, times three speeds, times three different axis tilts and rotations and releases and shapes of the shot, linear versus angular. And uh, so the game has gotten pretty complicated. But, uh, you know, what? it's fun, isn't it, Pete, to try to figure it out? That's what keeps you and I alive and keeps us going is trying to figure out the answers and, and sharing it with people. There's nothing like a person come up to you and say, oh, I just shot my first 200 game. Oh, I that's just right. shot my first yeah. 600. You know, that yeah. that's. That's the, the, the thing that we're in it for, isn't it? Yeah, and Freddie, you just uh, verified what I said. There's so much more knowledge out there. I just uh, learned 2,700 more things I have to learn now. Thanks a lot. <laughs> well, it's, you, you know what? It, it don't take too long when you have the master plan. We call it the master plan of great bowling. The delivery, the lane, the equipment, the five adjustments, and your brain. And yeah. so, you know, it's train your brain to improve your game. Not your game itself. Your game's your game. But you got to got to get that brain really clicking, and it's got to work pretty quick in today's environment, don't it? You're the best, Fred. You are the best. God bless you, Pete. Thank I just enjoyed uh, always working with you and being around you. That's for sure. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Real real quick before we let Pete go, Fred. What what would you tell Pete, or what did you tell Pete, a guy with such classic form? How how in the world can his game get off? What what did you tell him uh, when he wasn't quite as sharp as he'd like to be? You know, uh, usually that I had a little formula that I used for years, and I still use it to this day, called T plus S equals R. And if your timing and your swing's off, you can't get a good release. It's impossible. So I would fine-tune a person's timing. But, you know, in fact, I'm going to use this in my speech, and I'll talk about it now. But I said to Don Johnson, first time we ever worked, I said, well, Don, we had to figure out who you are. What do you mean by that, coach? I said, well, are you a roller, a stroker, or a cranker? And we didn't come up with that that day, obviously. I just met him, just got to work with him. And about four weeks go by, he says, hey, Fred, you said, who, who am I? And I said, uh, yeah, that's, I remember saying something like that, Coco. And he said, I'm not a stroker and I'm not a cranker. He said, I'm a croaker. He said, I'm in between a stroker and a cranker. He said, I'm a croaker. <laughs> so I never forgot that. It was a fun day. And uh, I think what the biggest thing to answer your question is to make sure that people stay who they are. Your personality is your personality. Your drumbeat, I call it your OPL, your optimum performance level. What is that number? What is that drumbeat? You cannot change that more than about 5% plus or minus. Well, we don't have to with all the bowling balls and the wrist actions and, and the game that we have to change the shape of the shot from hooking it seven, eight, nine boards to throwing it up the lane. We can do all that with our five adjustments. But don't change your game, change your adjustments. And you train your brain to change the adjustments. Then you see it on the lane. The problem we have, in fact, I just designed a whole new program on reading lanes and playing lanes. And I put out a house pattern, a 48-foot heavy pattern, a medium pattern, and a short pattern. And then I, I pass out pass outs every week when you come in. I charge 20 bucks, and you go down, you bowl a half an hour on each pattern. And you mark down your own, where you stood, what ball you used, what you was thinking, what you did. And then this is a 12-week program on playing lanes. And you, you start out, you play lanes and angles for, for, for the first two weeks. And the next two weeks, you use angles and bowling balls. And next two weeks, you have angles, bowling balls, lofts, and speeds. And next two weeks, you have angles, bowling balls, lofts, and speeds, and releases. Then the last week, you put it all into a package. You take all the adjustments and all the four patterns, and you make up your master plan to great bowling. 
all with your game and here's your adjustment plan. So when you see the ball go down the lane, you've been watching the ball go down the lane on these different patterns. You know, oh, I know exactly what to do here. I pull this ball out, I do this, I do this. So the reason we teach people, we talk to them a lot, we give them a lot of mental thought. Sometimes that's bad. We move too fast and I say, don't ever work on more than three things at one time. That's max. It's called myelination of the neurons of the brain. I studied the brain pretty heavy for about 20 years and how to coach people. It's called coaching pedagogy. It's all the parts of the puzzle, putting it into an understandable, playable package that a player understands, but it's got to be according to them, not according to me. And that's the fun part for a coach is to teach the different athletes with different styles, with the different drum beats, the personality profiles, and the different bowling balls and layouts and angles and how they see a lane and how they play the different patterns. It's different for all of us a little bit, and it's uh, it's fun to figure all that out and to work on that. All right, Pete, I'll tell you what, let's let you, uh, let you get out of here. I really appreciate you spending some time here with us. We'll We'll uh, talk to Fred here momentarily, but I, I wanted to thank you personally uh, for coming on here. And, you know, Lenny's a great guy. You're a great guy. I haven't really met Fred before, so we're going to find out if he's a great guy here too. But by all accounts, uh, everything he's done in the bowling world is is incredible. So, Pete, congratulations once again, and thank you very much for coming on the Bowler Show. Thanks for having me. And, and Freddie, great seeing you again. Can't wait till March. Me as well. We'll see you guys later. Anytime, guys. Anytime you want me on here, just let me know. Awesome. Thanks, Pete. Thank you. Talk to you guys later. All right. All right, Fred. Welcome back to the Bowler Show. <laughs> We're speaking with Hall of Fame. I like to just say that. Hall of Fame coach Fred Borden. Um, you you mentioned a lot of your some of your your thoughts on bowling. Um, just just put a number. If you if you can take a take a second and think of a number. What what number would you but for the importance of mental game versus physical and, and what, what number would do you actually kind of teach? Well, you know what? Uh, at the end of the day, there's an old saying, I think we heard in sport that, uh, you know, it's 90% metal once you put in the game, but just having good game. If you have a bad attitude, when I do clinics, I always start off now and I have for the last so oh, 25 years probably and say, would someone in the audience like get up and explain to me how a bad attitude works and how a bad attitude is good? Hmm. I said, please don't do that because I don't want you to embarrass yourself. I said, because we'd get into a little bit of a, a back and forth on that. And I said, you know what? I have a rule that I have and I call it the 15 second rule. After a, a shot, you have 15 seconds to get rid of it. Oh, I just threw the best shot I've ever seen in the history of bowling. Yeah, well, you got 15 seconds. You're going to have to do it again, so calm down, okay? Be who you are. The win theory, what's important now? The next shot. So now, oh, I just threw a terrible shot, and I'm not, you're terrible. I said, well, how's your coach treating you? Person will say, well, you know, I really don't have a coach. Say, yes, you do. You're your own coach every day. It's self one talking to self two. How is your self-talk? How are you brainwashing yourself? You're talking yourself into it or you're talking yourself out of it. So I want to say that I got to work with seven sports psychologists and it dawned on me more and more and more and more. I better study the brain and the neurotransmitters and the reps and how you train an athlete called coaching pedagogy, all the parts of the puzzle. And to learn how to do that with the different personality profiles from a charged up Marshall Holman to a laid back uh, uh, Mike Alby, okay, and, and anything in between and the different people and to talk with them. Well, and here's what I like to do. And this is a message to coaches. Every lesson that I give, I always sit down to the athlete and said, before we start, what I'd like to do is you tell me what's bugging you. <laughs> what are you having trouble with? I want you to tell me what you're having trouble with your bowling game first. Your accuracy, uh, making your spares, uh, hitting your target. I may have to provoke some thought at that time, but they'll say, well, this and that. And, and, and I say, no, I'm going to watch you. See, I can watch you bowl and I can see what your physical uh, problems are. Right. But I can't watch you think. You got to share with me what's going on up here. What's happening in that brain cell? How are we doing there? And in the end of the day, I've had people say, you know, the biggest part of our lesson was you, you got me thinking better when I bowl now. 
And that's always my goal before I'm done with the athlete. We start out with your delivery and we talk about the seven keys to playing a lane. You read the lane with seven keys every day, the same seven keys. What changes are the five adjustments on how to manipulate the seven keys. And then the six bowling balls are 12. And I say, well, if you have 20 bowling balls, I know I can whip you because I know you're confused. <laughs> you know, I said, if you, you don't need more than six eights about maximum. You don't need more than that. Two in the oil category, two in the medium category, two in the dry category, and about four boards difference between each ball. Well, that's 24 boards, six bowling balls. And the coefficient of friction and the pin and the cores and all the things we have available to us, we can make balls huge to very little. So, you know, it's uh, probably the mental game to get back to your question. But I, I think all of it's important getting to that point. But at the end of the day, how good are you thinking every day? What's your mindset? What's your self-talk, your focus, your concentration, your diaphragmatic breathing? In through the nose, out through the mouth. Put that oxygen into your bloodstream. Calm yourself down. Let all the tension drip out and fall on the floor and go external focus. That's your mind is out on the lane. Internal focus is for skill development. That's when you're working on your push away, your release, your finish position, all that. You can't be thinking back here and throwing the ball out there. You could have your mind out there on that lane, and you better see the line in your mind. So I ask everybody, like Billy Hoffman, a great Billy Hoffman, twice national amateur champion on Team USA, now runs a training camp in Hong Kong. He said, uh, uh, you know, I don't look at anything when I bowl. Mm -hmm. So I got to know him. The better I got to know him. And, and Susie Minchu asked him about it. He said, I don't look at nothing. He said, if I looked at something, I could miss it. <laughs> I said, well, you know what it is? I said, Hoff, you're really looking at the whole lane, aren't you? I said, you're seeing the angle. Oh, yeah, that's what I'm doing, coach. I see the shape of what the ball's doing, and I try to make that shape hit the pocket. I said, that's what you do. It's a 60-foot line in your mind. From the foul line, that's your launch angle, to the target, to the break point, to the pocket, and you see that line. What's your favorite color? I want you to see that three, four inches wide. Making a seven pin, it's going that way. If it's ten pins, going that way. And and the shape of the shot, if you're using your spare ball, is going to curve less. You see that line. The line, you flex your knees and go and just throw it toward that line where your eyes are focused, your swing will go. This is the best machine ever made in the history of mankind. The big boss made this one. You don't have to tell it what to do after you train it. All you got to do is see what you want to do and keep doing it. So I think it all comes down to how good you think at the end of the day. The good players, and I noticed that from players, to be honest with you. I didn't figure all this stuff out. I was lucky to work with seven psychologists. Dr. Dan Gould, he was great. Dr. Eric Lasser, a lot of them. Okay, Dr. Shane Murphy, the head of the program at the Olympic Training Center. And I ask a lot of questions. As you can already tell, I can talk. And uh, I said, you know, if you were to say one thing, what is that? And I asked Dr. Laz, I asked all of them, and they said, well, is the quiet their brain? When we had a helmet that had 17 sensors that, that measured brave, wing, brave length activity in your brain, the world-class athletes have four, and it's in the frontal cortex. Hmm. The intermediate players have like 30. They're like, their mind's going off like a fireworks show. Well, see, as you train, you get to where you trust your training, we call it. You know your walk is pretty good. You know your start is pretty good. You know your swing looks pretty good, your finish position. All you got to do is what really changes is where you throw the ball and how you get it off your hand as far as your, your rotation, plus rotation, minimum rotation, and loft and speed and the adjustments plan the angles. Once we get a person to understand that master plan, Boy, do they improve. And I, I've, I've visited with a lot of players, and, and over the years I ask players, like Carmen Salvino, Don Johnson, and, and even, and I worked with Don before he ever won his first title, but uh, the guys that were already good players, Harry Smith, I said, boy, you bowled good today. What were you thinking? Oh, coach, I was just thinking about where I was throwing the ball. I got that invariably. I thought, man. That's the key. These guys aren't thinking much when they're competing. They, they, they got it down so good that they're just, you know, I think of it in baseball. My buddy won the Cy Young Award, uh, Dean Chance. He had a 165 ERA. I was partners with him in some business and helped train a boxer named Ernie Shavers. Of and uh, 
and uh, I spent a lot of time with Dean. And uh, he pitched a real good game against us one year in Cleveland. I said, boy, Dean, you know, you, you won today three to two. He said, I said, but you didn't look like you had your good stuff. He says, boards, I don't know how I did it. I said, you know why you're a winner? You think like a winner. And that's what I try to do with athletes is try to get them to think like a winner. That's getting rid of the bad as quickly as possible, Getting not getting excited when you have it going, the 15-second rule, having a program, having it all precisely laid out, step by step, second by second. There's no guesswork here. It's all structure. Structure, structure, structure. It's like any biz, like building a building. It's like doing this show. You guys had a lot of work put into just getting us all together to get this thing structured up to be here tonight. So you know what it is. All right. And let's touch on a couple of points there. Number one, uh, I got a lesson from Mike Jazz now a couple of years ago. The first thing he did was hand me a form and say, hey, what what are you thinking? What do you what do you want to work on? Um, so that that kind of reminded me um of how he handled that the the middle part he wanted to know what i was thinking also so i thought that was kind of neat um i know this is probably going to be an impossible question but you've talked about a few of the bowlers you've worked with over the years and and the enjoyment you get out of somebody saying hey i just shot my first 200 or my first 600 but uh take take a moment see if you can pick out an athlete or two or maybe even a non-athlete that that really sticks in your memory over the years that Hey, this is, you know, this is a, a person that I really changed their game for the better. Well, as, as Pete said, it's a hard one to say, but probably, and for a lot of reasons, not just bowling reasons, but Don Johnson and I, we, he named, we were godparents to one of his children. Uh, and Don really helped me as a coach. It was in the late 60s, and I was coaching. I had coached Terry Smith, and I'd already worked with Salvino and drilled some bowling balls for him because I was a ball driller. I liked physics in school. I studied physics, and I'd get carried away on all the details. But, you know, there's one thing about Don that really hit me pretty hard is, first of all, he never got too upset. He stayed calm, and he would try anything. He never thought and never made me feel like, well, coach, I can't do that. That won't work. And there's a lot of people that, that, that start you out that way. Now, it's my job to change that thinking if they think that way and to try to get them not to say, I can't do this. What do you mean you can't do that? You look pretty able-bodied to me. Yeah. And, and, and I helped a guy bowl 300 in a wheelchair, a guy by the name of Blaine Dinius in a wheelchair. He shot 300. So, you know what? You can do this if you think you can. Be careful what you're thinking. It might come true. So Don was probably, if I'd have said Don, Cocoa butter, we called him as his nickname. I said, why don't you do a pirouette in the middle of your approach and then walk up there and throw it? He just said, okay, you think it'll work? <laughs> you know? He said, I'll throw it overhand through the masking unit if I have to, coach. Tell me what you want me to do. He wasn't afraid of anything, and he did it all with such a good spirit. So I'm going to say to the, anybody that's tuned in, get the good spirit and try and mark things down and have a plan. Plan your work and work your plan. Don't get confused. That's computer overload. <laughs> and 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 so I got to watch as a coach. I want to teach him everything I know. So I'm, I've done it. Trust me. I found out a little later, boy, I went a little too strong. I went too much with this person. I should have backed off about a half an hour ago, but I get carried away and I want to help them. And I want to, and they're getting into it and they're getting into it. But I want to say this. I never give a lesson without making a complete list of everything we talk about. Everything. Then I build a complete lesson plan when it's over. I say, okay, first thing I want you to do is this. I want you to do 60 shots. It's called myelination of the neurons. That's called muscle memory. No, it's called hippocampus memory. Getting the memory into the hippocampus. It's like Curry shooting them three-pointers. You think he's stopping and thinking? He's just shooting that thing up there. Baseball pitcher, Dean Chance. That's what I said to him. I said, Dean, you beat us three to two, and it didn't look like you had your good stuff. He said, I said, but you know what? He said, I don't know, coach. I said, that's because you're a winner. I said, you know how to win. And that's when you start getting checks as a bowler and you don't have your good stuff. It's because you stayed there. I have a good Johnny Petregler story. We probably don't have time to tell it tonight, but I'm going to tell it during the Hall of Fame speech. And, and you know, all the people we work with, I have a plaque here on the wall, has 42 athletes and a diamond ring here that has 72 diamonds that they give me. All the guys that I work, a bunch of guys that I work with, 
And every one of them had something special. And I tried to capture that and then put it into the package. So I learned so much from them. Uh, I didn't figure it all out. I was never that smart to figure all that stuff out. But I could sure pay attention and listen to what they said and mark it down. And uh, then I realized I never want to give a lesson without marking it down. All this time, you know, they say you remember what, about six, seven percent of what you learn in a given presentation. Well, then if I'm going to work with you for two hours, I better mark everything down and give you a checklist and give you a lesson plan. It better be structured. Every time you come, I tell everybody I work with now, when you come back, I want you to bring that lesson plan. I got to know exactly where I'm at because I work sometime with 40, 50, 60 people at a time. Right. And I need to keep you on track, real structured here. Where are you? I said, now, if you don't get a chance to practice, uh, don't come back for another lesson. So I, I give them a practice plan and I tell I give them home drills to do along with lesson plans, along with a complete. Now I say, you know, you're not going to hurt my feelings. If, if I'm moving too fast for you, say, hey, coach, I, I'm not following you. OK, you're not going to hurt my feelings. I'm here for one thing, to make you a better player. That's all I'm here for. OK, one. And number two, say, you know what? That don't make sense to me, coach. I say, you know, I may have six ways to tell you the same thing. So you're not going to hurt my feelings. In fact, when I do a seminar, I tell people, if you have any questions, please stop me, raise your hand, get up, ask the question. If I don't know the answer, I know a lot of people in bowling. <laughs> I will find out the answer. Trust me. I will research and I will talk to the brain cells of bowling where, that are smarter than me that will help me come back to you and I will get it. I'll get you the answer. So I think, uh, you know, uh, I appreciate, uh, I think, people like yourself and I know what people like Pete, people that's put all this time and effort into the sport. I wish we had uh, more coaches. We need four and five and six coaches in every bowling center across the world. How can and one- there, And there used to be that. Oh, yeah, with YABA, we got rid of that. When I, when I grew up with YABA, that, you know, I, I don't remember ever bowling without having bowling coaches around me. And that's the truth. And, you know, then when I became head coach, I said to Jerry Koenig, I said, Jerry, we need to have a coaching certification program. So we started the bronze, silver and gold coaching program. And, uh, you know, it, it's it's uh, it's something about how many people are really interested. But I don't know that we put our arms around them and pulled them in and said, hey, God bless you. We, we like this. Come on with us. Let's we, we want to give you some more ammunition. All right, I got a, a quick question, and then we'll then we'll get to the real matter of the subject uh, at hand. What, uh, what what did Don Johnson do wrong on his twelfth shot when he shot two ninety nine? Well, you know what? I think he threw it a little harder. I think it was a little bit. He got a little charged up. I think it was a little faster. In fact, I was sitting up on the with uh, with the, the announcers. Oh wow. Yeah, they said, come on up here, Fred, sit with us. And, and I sit up there because uh, I knew him pretty well. And, uh, and I, oh, he threw it a little fast. Get back, get back, get back. And it just hit a little flat. It hit the three pin a little heavy and, and just hit the six pin light because when you hit the three pin heavy, it hits the left side of the six and rings the 10. It was a ring and 10, but yeah. a ring and 10 is uh, just a little fast and didn't finish, didn't go ahead and complete. That was the fastest shot he threw of the whole game, I think. That, and it don't take much. You know, people say, in fact, uh, well, I need to work on my speed. I say, yeah, well, how fast do you throw a ball? They say, well, I throw it, let's just say, 18 miles an hour. So I asked this one gal, and I won't use her name because she's a Team USA player. I said, well, how much faster do you think you got to throw it when they're dry? She said, oh, 30%, 20%, I said, 30%? Wow. I said, 18 miles an hour, that'd be 5.4. <laughs> I said, that, it's 5%. 5% faster, 5% slower. If everybody in the building can see you doing it, you're overcooking it. It's a feeling of your swing and your footwork. That's all it is. Your feet go 5% faster, your swing goes 5% faster. I think he got about 10% faster on that shot to answer your question. That's interesting, obviously. Uh, it, it was a different game back then. Uh, there's no, almost no such thing as fallback. Uh, this shot that people obviously remember uh, when Don went down the approach, you know, the ball – Ball really isn't making much of a move <laughs> left at all at any point. And, you know that's just the way the game was back then. But bingo, uh, Fred. Let's 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 move on to the you know you in typical coaching fashion here. You've talked more about 
uh, the people you've coached and, and, and a lot of coaching methods, but let's, let's talk about you. You, you found out that you were inducted into the PBA hall of fame. Take, take a little bit of time and tell us, you know, kind of the process and, and how, how surprised were you? And uh, just talk a little bit about the, the phone call that you got when you were told you were being inducted. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm a little embarrassed because of that phone call. <laughs> I, had talked, I had talked to a friend of mine, Johnny Mazza, about this new coaching program that I've worked on for about two and a half years. And uh, it's beginners, intermediate, we call it the power of three, advanced, senior citizens, two-handers, and then the, the lane play, 12-week lane play program. All documented, black and white, all the artwork, and we filmed all of it. I had a guy with a camera and a good friend of mine, uh, George Herbert, and we filmed all, every, all the lesson plans. Okay, so like the advanced lesson plan is a 12-week program, and we walk you through the, the delivery and then lane play and then equipment, the five adjustments, and, and then the mental game. And uh, that takes 10 weeks. And the last two weeks, we work with you on your master plan to where you get out of the program with your book all filled out. So I said something to Johnny Moz. I said, Johnny, I'm, I'll be 82 years old this summer. I said, I'm, I'm getting to that age where I can't, I can't do this anymore. But I said, I hate not to have more coaching. We need more coaching. We need to have it in every bowling center and all the automatic scoring systems and everything. We can film this. And now, I don't have to film it. I said, they can have the PBA guys film it. I said, and different people film it. And he said, well, you know, I know Tom Clark. Let me give him a call. I said, oh, wow, that'd be great. Sure. And I know, of, I know Tom, I don't know him to have dinner with him, but I know him and I always had a lot of respect for Tom and I know who he is and I know how hard he's worked in the industry as well. And uh, so I get a call here. Oh, it's been about three weeks ago, I guess. Uh, uh, Tom Clark, Fred, Tom Clark, PBA. I said, oh yeah, oh, well, thanks for calling me back. I, you know, I assume, I, I guess I assumed that Johnny talked to him. So, you know, I just went off on him about the coaching program. Oh, yeah. Well, thanks for calling back. I hope you have some interest in this, Tom, and this and that. And I'm telling you about plan lanes and oil to dry and in between bowling balls and cover stocks and pins and cores and all RGs and all this stuff and, and, and what we can teach people. And we have it all documented. We have pass outs that we can give, make copies of it at the best. When they come in and pay their money, you give them a copy in. You have clinics, you have youth clinics, you have family clinics, you have senior citizen clinics, you have all these clinics with all these programs, all completely documented the design and all this. And I went off on him for, oh God, I don't know how long. <laughs> now that I look back, I'm embarrassed for it. And he said, well, Fred, that sounds really good. He said, well, that's a lot of stuff there you just talked about. I said, yeah. I said, I've worked hard at it. I said, I put a couple of years in on it and I've got about 870 pages, I guess, written and all that. He said, well, the real reason I called, <laughs> he says, is you've been inducted into PBA Hall of Fame. I went, whoa. <laughs> Yeah, take take a moment. Yeah. Take a moment. I've been pinching myself so much, my rear end's purple. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, there's not a bigger Hall of Fame than the PBA Hall of Fame. There's a little over 100 people, I think 112, 114 people, something like that, in the Hall of Fame. And to be in that group, whoa. Yeah. And uh, to be recognized... I was embarrassed, though. <laughs> you know, he called me to tell me that, and I'm telling him all this stuff for 15 minutes, I'll bet. <laughs> you know, and I'm going to use that in my speech a little bit. But, you know, I was vaccinated with Victrola needle. People don't know what a Victrola needle is, so i got to tell them the big black records, and the needle goes down. They hit my arm with that, so this thing works pretty good. You know? <laughs> so I just, I just went off on Tom. So, Tom, I need to apologize for not even letting you tell me why you called me, because it was a change. It was a day-changing time. At 81, and I'm having a PET scan uh, Tuesday, and I've had a few things. I've had four stents in my heart. I've had uh -huh. prostate cancer, and I've had a few issues. Wow. But I love it. I love the bowling, and I love coaching, and I love you know, I'm a proprietor and, and, and I've been blessed. I've been very lucky and bowling has been good to me. And, uh, I made up my mind years ago. I wasn't going to be a pro bowler. I was going to, and I was a PBA member. Yeah. Uh, 
but I was going to uh, own bowling centers and be in the bowling. I love the business side of the ledger. So I, I never even give him a chance to explain it to me. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm going to apologize to him in my kickoff of the of my speech and let him know that I'm sorry that I didn't, I didn't even take a breath to listen to what you had to say. I thought for sure Johnny Mazza had called him and he wanted to talk about the coaching, you know, and that's where my brain is all the time, I guess. I, uh, so I need to apologize to him. That's, that's, that's good stuff. Uh, I'm going to ask you one more question and then I'll bring in my co-host Luke here to see if he's got anything for you here at the end of the end of our time. So uh, I saw something on the internet that said you were involved in the, the, first first cosmic bowling or it was called lunar bowling back then yeah i patented that in 1992 and uh in fact i patented uh, the vector bowling ball and sold it to columbia the first low mass heavy core bowling ball sure the don, the don johnson gold palm the, the horseshoe and you moved it on your hand so i've always been a little crazy on trying to figure some stuff out and i was in on a trip doing a clinic and I was at one of these uh, places where they sell all the games in the, in the airport. And I walked in the back and it's all lit up with these black lights shining on stuff. I said, that's it. I got to do that to my entire bowling center. So I spent a quarter of a million dollars on lights and electronics and everything. And, and I went back and I, well, was, the Lord does things funny for us sometimes. Or there's, there's this guy by the name of Fred Ziesenheim who's since passed away from Pittsburgh. He was the head of the, Patent Search Hall of Fame, which ended up in Akron, Ohio. And he was there and he called me and he said, you know, I'm a bowler. I bowl with the uh, our, our league at the country club. And he said, I don't even play golf, but I wanted to bowl with my buddy. So I joined the country club, the Oakmont in Pittsburgh and mm -hmm. Oakmont Country Club. I said, wow. He said, I'd like to come for a bowling lesson. I said, well, sure. That's what I do. He said, yeah, I've heard about you. I'd like to come. So he and I hit it off to Fred's and uh, he was a lawyer. And so he gave me my lesson or I gave him his lesson and took. And so I took him into my office the first lesson. I said, Fred, can I show you something? I said, I, I know I don't have to have a non-use, non-disclosure agreement with you, but I have a thing. And I wanted you to tell me if it's patentable, do you think? So he walks in, I turn the lights out and I turn all these black lights on. I had all this shiny stuff on the walls and this and be happy. And I had all these sayings and everything. And, and uh, he said, wow, what is this? I said, well, we, I call it lunar bowling, bowling in the black lights. And well, it's pretty interesting. I said, I want to do it to the whole bowling center. I said, you think it's patentable? He said, well, I'd have to do a patent search Hall of Fame. I'd have to do a patent search. He says, I'm here for the Hall of Fame. He said, and I go there all the time with the people at the patent uh, offices. He said, I can certainly do a, a search for you, Fred. And I said, okay, can I afford you? He said, I'll tell you what, I'll give you equity. I'll do it for 10,000 bucks. I said, you got it. So he went and he did a search. He said, there's no prior art or nothing about bowling under ambient light. And uh, the fog machines and the sound, and it's a promotional tool for the sport of bowling. He said they have some where they just turn the lights out, but he said it's not nothing close to what you're talking about. He said, so yes, I think it is patentable. So he said, I'm willing to write it all up for you, and we'll get after it if you if you want to go. I said, yep. And so I'd spent quite a bit of money doing this. Yep. And uh, then all of a sudden, Brunswick's doing it, and AMF's doing it. Pretty soon it's going everywhere and everybody's doing it. So we have the head patent attorney for Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company because Frank had passed away, bowled at our bowling center and I knew him. So I said to him, I said, you know, I got this problem. He said, let me take a look at it. So when we went and we had a meeting to make a long story short. And this little guy is a little, uh, little real you could tell a real bright guy, about five foot seven, a little Mr. Peepers type of guy. And he sat there and he never said a word. Well, I didn't even know he's the head of the whole firm. This is this is a big firm. They have a place in Atlanta, one down there in Florida. They have one in Akron. They're all over. They're big. They're, they do millions a year. And, right. uh, and uh, he said, you know, I've heard all the reasons we can lose this lawsuit. How can we win this lawsuit? Would somebody explain that? So about four turns, he said, bing, bing, bing. He said, okay, Fred, you got a deal. I'll tell you what, you give us 40%, you get 60 and we'll sue them. <laughs> we shook hands and went out. And then three years later, we beat both AMF and Brunswick in federal oh, wow. court. And we took them to federal court. And That's we made awesome. a settlement before we went all the way. But we got a settlement. And, uh, you know, uh, I think because I'm a competitor as well. 
from bowling and being around people that are competitors that it got competitive, but I'd like to think it was also respectable. Yeah, and we won the patent, uh, the, the lawsuit. We had a very good patent. And it, they're good for 17 years, as you know. And I did that in 92, got my number in 93, and here it is, 2022, going to be 23 here next couple of weeks. So, yeah, yeah that was – That's and, good and stuff. I did, did 60000 a month with it in my bowling center. Wow. Yeah, I didn't uh... – I didn't uh, realize that's where it started. I saw that on the internet. And real quick, before I turn it over to my partner, uh, we have somebody in the chat here, uh, Shane Blaymeyers, who says he had a session with you uh, a long time ago. Yeah. And uh, he bowled two 800s in the same month right after that. Uh, he bowled the regionals in Spokane, Washington. So I know you've got a million people, and you may or may not remember him. But well, he, I sure he do. I know the name because Shane is not an yeah. everyday name. Yeah. Right. So he wanted to thank you in the chat. So uh, that's that's uh, you know those are those are memories that you you've given to people that you know that that's, that's last a lifetime. Yeah, you got it. That's what makes it work, huh? Yeah. Exactly. All right, I'm gonna turn it over to my co-host. This is Luke Rosedahl. Thank you. Yeah. So bowling has changed a lot since you've. Uh, I mean, in, in the time that you've been doing what you've been doing, it's, it's changed a lot. So how difficult is it for you to manage when, you know, the game kind of fundamentally shifts because we introduce reactive balls and then and that changes that changes things. And then uh, now we have the two-handed movement. And so how do, you, how do you kind of manage that? How long do you give, how much do you pay attention to something between before you think, okay, well, this is probably going to be a thing, so I want to, I want to work with this or, well, this is kind of a fad or I don't necessarily like this. I don't want to go that direction. How, how do you kind of, how do you kind of work with that? You know, that's a very good question. Uh, I was in Perth, Australia as their guest speaker and I did clinics in six cities in Australia. I went there six times and I'm watching this young kid bowl and, and the coach for the United States, for the country of Australia said, I'm trying to get him to quit doing that. His name is Jason Belmonte. He was 12 years old. So I'm watching, and, and he said, Fred, now you're going to talk to Nike, and they're all bowling in a, in a tournament called the Rockaway. So this the, the coach for the team said, I can't get him to quit doing that no matter what I do. <laughs> well, he shot 693. He was 12 years old on a, on a tough pattern. This is before we had all the heavy scoring and the big bowling balls and everything. It was 30 years ago almost. <clears throat> so... I went into the office. I said to him, I said, you know, Don, I, I don't know that I'd change that kid's game. I'd just teach him how to have different tilts and rotations and play in lanes better. I said, he shot 693. He had the best set of the day. And this is a big tournament to have in Australia, which is the mothers, the fathers, the adults, the seniors, the kids, they all bowl in it. It's a big, massive family tournament for everybody. Okay. And I wanted to start it here in the States. But anyhow, he said, yeah, I said, teach him how to back it off and go up the back and not go around it, not tilt it so much and this and that. And I said, teach him how to change his ball motion. I said, this kid could really be good. I said, he hit some pins better than I ever saw. So, you know, you, you watch for a while. So I watched this kid. He, he had me mesmerized. I can remember to this day, I thought, I saw pin action I never saw in my life. I thought I saw all the best bowlers in the world. Mark Roth moved pins pretty good. You know, <laughs> this kid was moving them 30% more than Mark Roth. And then, you know, there's a, a, the question there is when I come up with something that I think is good, I try it with 10 to 15 high level people. If I don't get at least an 80 percent positive response, I don't do it no more or I change it. I change, I, I retune it. But I do a lot of uh, I use people as research people by going over things uh, uh, and, and testing them and saying, what do you think of that? Oh, coach, I like it. If I get positive response and then I get feedback, I said, well, practice it for a while and get back to me if you would. I'll, I only do this with people I really know uh, that I know will get back and close enough to me that I can get a feedback from them. And they'll tell me straight up. And then if it works, then I know I'm onto something. If uh, if it don't work, then I then I don't then I try to study the parts of the puzzle, the coaching pedagogy. Uh, that means that all your decisions and all your information is based on science, not Fred Borden's opinion. <laughs> so you look at the physics, you look at all the parts of it. I got to be honest with you, though, to answer your question the way I'd like to. 
I got lucky one year and shot 300 at the ABC tournament playing inside the fifth arrow. I was playing 27 with a Johnny Petraglia LT48. <laughs> And uh, I was playing the old fallback. You alluded to it a little earlier. Yeah, a uh -huh. fallback shot. And uh, I think I would like to see the weight blocks get lighter now that I know what it did to the sport. It allows you to throw it 19 miles an hour, 20 miles an hour. Yeah. The big heavy cores, you could do that with a 14-ounce three-daughter. It mm -hmm. sails 65 feet. So, And I think we have to make the weight blocks a little lighter. Uh, we need to... Uh, have three different patterns, uh, an A, B, and C pattern, let's call it. Oh, you shot a 300 on an A pattern? Wow, you must really be good. A B pattern, a C pattern is a house shot. Maybe four patterns. Okay, so we need different patterns in the, in the league sanction according to their skill level. It's like golf's got the red tees, the white tees, the blue tees, the black tees in some places. And it's different things for different people with different skill levels. And there's different uh, rewards or, or awards for what you do on different patterns and and then educate people about what it is and what you're doing with the game. Make it make sense. Don't do it in one year. I have a 10-year plan that I designed for that and make a 20% change over a 10-year plan. Don't mm -hmm. just drop the gauntlet and make everybody mad. Yeah. Just do it a little <laughs> bit at a time. And, and uh, pretty soon we'd have it back uh, uh, and and that's the part that I see that I can't ever figure out, to, to be honest with you, that how do you get that instituted? How do you get it handled? Uh, yeah. Our game is and our business, our industry is turned into a leisure time recreation more than I like. I love good bowling. It's yeah. been my whole life. And uh, I think we'll always have it all. Don't get me wrong. And I think the leisure time recreators, God bless them, we need them. That, but it's our job to turn them into bowlers. Yeah. How do you going to like something you know nothing about? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to answer that for me. I use that a lot with people saying, you know, I don't know much about, well, you don't want to get sit beside me in an airplane on a long trip. Well, what do you do? For, <laughs> what do you do for a living? Well, I'm yeah. a bowling coach. Yeah. You know? How many hours <laughs> in this flight? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think I'll go to the bowling center as soon as I get off the plane. They're joking with me, obviously, you know. But uh, yeah, I think there's so much for us to do. But uh, I'm getting to that age where it's, it's hard to... Uh, go at that level that you need to go to to have the uh, excitement and the, and the drive and to keep that going. Carmen and I talk, oh, once a month, usually on the phone, and we talk about that a lot. He's 89. I'll be 82, and, and uh, we talk about that quite a bit. I don't know if I answered your question or not. I took off yeah. on it. No, no, that's great. Yeah. That's great. You know, just like this show, i got to applaud you guys for doing it. Okay, and when you ask me to come on, I wouldn't. If I'd said no, shame on me. Uh, you know, it's people like you, and and the two of you putting this thing together, and it's it's time in your life that you have to, you have away from your other things that you probably could do and calm down and relax, but you get all fired up to listen to guys like me go off <laughs> and all this stuff. And so I just want to thank you uh, for what you do, and I wish we had more people. Maybe you ought to patent your or do something or or do a franchise or something and show people how to do this and uh because there's a lot that you did to get to where you are i know that too i i wouldn't even have a clue to do what you guys are doing uh but uh i, I sure appreciate it i want you to know that well friend i, I appreciate you saying that I'll, I'll give you a, a quick background of the bowler show i i started off on a small sports radio talk show here in kansas city and I came up with, hey, let's have a 20-minute segment on bowling. Uh, I can get a sponsor, local bowling center, and we'll just we'll just talk bowling for 20 minutes of the two hours. So it, it turned into, after that, it turned into an hour. That turned into, hey, we got to spawn this off into a second show, a two-hour show. I've got too many people, uh, too many guests, and and I bowled on tour a couple of stints, uh, short stints, but I made a lot of contacts, and I was able to you know, pretty much get in touch with everybody. And of course, now in the, the world we live in, uh, the world of Facebook, I can talk to anybody and uh, pretty much get them on the show. And, and I started this show uh, originally, the sports show started back in, in 2004, but the, the bowling show part segment started in 2011. And then from 2014 to 2017, the, the full bowler show was born. I did it for four years. I took off four years. Like you said, there's a lot of stuff going on in your life. And then every Sunday, and of course, we're bowlers. And uh, I run tournaments also. So 
there isn't that much time. Wow. But <laughs> I, I've, been, I've been blessed. It, it gives me away. I, I was a, I'm not going to lie. When, up until I was probably 40, I, I was a taker in the bowling world. I, I f- didn't give back much. Um, it was me, 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 strike. If I didn't strike, I'd be upset. And, uh, you know, I got to a point where I, th- I said, hey, I, I, I've got to I've got to change. And, and this stuff like this, some charity events, running tournaments and, and some other stuff is, is my way of giving back. And, and it gives you a good feeling. And I'm sure you understand that that good feeling. Just just helping people and seeing some of the stuff in the chat here. Uh, you make an impression on people for life. And, and without this, these venues, uh, you wouldn't have that. Or you said a mouthful there. That's uh, that's. Uh, but you know what? Uh, how how often does a person twenty and thirty years old and that know what they're going to do with that? You say that your late thirties, forties. I, I I think I follow that a lot as well. You know that yeah. same thing. Once we do something enough, and then all of a sudden we say, "Wow, this is really pretty neat." Yeah. Well, I can't tell you that uh, if we had more shows and we had more coaches and we had more people talking about bowling, teaching about the different cores and cover stocks and pins and oil patterns and all the above. You know what it is. And uh, you you uh, you do that across the board and put it up on the automatic scoring system and then do in-classroom times and do clinics and camps, summer camps for kids. You know, we could, we could develop a million new bowlers before you could snap your fingers. And I think other than selling more bowling balls, we got to look at how we develop more bowlers. I think uh, we should cut that. Luke, if you get a chance, cut that from Fred and put that somewhere where we can bring that up uh, at any point, what he just said in the last few moments there. Um, Fred, before we let you go, our, our last guest of the day is a guy I'd like to see you you having a crack at coaching. Uh, do you know uh, Jim Cripps, also known as the backwards bowler? Yeah, I, well, I don't know him, know him, but I've watched some shots, and I, I was flabbergasted the first time I saw him throw the ball. I said, wow, now how's that? Let me see that again. So I, I must have watched it, I don't know how many times. And I said, you know, that really takes some talent to be able to do that. It takes some skill uh, to do something like that. It takes uh, something special just to think that far out of the box for openers, <laughs> much more or less than perfect it and be able to do it like he does. It's pretty phenomenal. I'm, I got to tip my hat and I don't know him, know him, but I, I know who he is. That's for sure. Well, there's a future, future client for you there. I don't, I don't know where you would begin. And, and we'll, we'll talk to Jim a little bit about, you know, how, how he got into it and how he started doing it. I know a little of the background on him, but um, you know, that just goes to show you right there. If you don't think you can do something or, you know, if you, if you want to give up on, on one of your dreams or, or even just a sport like our, our sport of bowling, uh, a guy like Jim shows you, hey, it, don't give up. There, there's you know more than one way to skin a cat. Well, you know what? And, and you said something there that really triggered a thought with me is I don't care how you throw the ball. You still got to play the lanes. And the lanes are different every day. And they're different from the time you start to the time you finish. So it's what I call staying matched up. I yeah. say, you're pretty good at playing lanes. Yeah. I said, well, how good are you at staying matched up? You afraid to change balls in the middle of a, of a 230 game, but yeah. you see it, it just tripped the four pin the last time down and, and, and you better move three boards left or you better change balls. You better do something because pretty soon you're going to hit the nose. So, you know, playing lanes is even if a guy has a perfect game, it's playing lanes. And I, I can tell you with a lot of the tour players that I work with, that's all we ended up working on their brain and their adjustments. All right, Fred, before we let you go, we have one of our regulars who has a, a comment here in the chat. Luke, if you get a chance, bring that up on the screen. Uh, his name is James Sniffen Jr. He took a multi-day classic from you and Jerry Edwards back in 2001-ish as a middle school youth bowler. And one of his fondest memories uh, was that. He says, thanks for all your efforts to bolster the bowling world. And uh, congrats on the Hall of Fame induction. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you. That's all I can say. It's uh, why we do it. Yeah. All right, Fred. Well, we appreciate you spending time with us here on a Sunday night. As you said, everybody's got stuff going on. I'm sure you do also, but uh, I, I don't even know where to start. You, you've done so much for the bowling world and, and for so many people, you know, just the people we see in the chat. And uh, I've written down the angle ball loft speed releases and, and about 16 other things you've uh, giving away for free today. I'm going to try hey. to that, uh, or look into that, but we can't thank you That's enough uh, for coming on our show. Well, thank you and God bless. I appreciate it. All right, Luke. That was uh, that was Hall of Fame coach Fred Borden getting into the BBA Hall of Fame, 
And uh, boy, how, how how long could we have spent on that? You think another two or three hours, possibly? Uh, yeah, not yeah. even delving into very deeply. He's 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 an amazing guy, and, and to be a perfect honest, the stuff he said there at the end, he 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 gets it. Yeah, yeah. So it's one of those things you could just keep uh, keep feeding the ball. It's one of those, you're just giving giving the alley oop or volleyball, just kind of just kind of <laughs> bump it his way and let him spike it. So. Uh, imagine the the personal stories he has in his head that he could bring up. Not not just from, uh, hey, uh, this guy came to me and uh, you know I, I couldn't throw it, you know couldn't get it off my hand or whatever. But just the the stories of the people he's helped over the years. You know we we never got into the Team USA stuff or uh, a lot of stuff because you know he's just uh, had so much uh, good stuff to talk about. So and uh, you know. Yeah, I, I would like to, you know, maybe maybe you can get some video from uh, our next guest and we can uh, uh, get some tips. So let's uh, let's go ahead and bring in our last guest here. We had, we we've gone a little bit long here, which is fine. We have uh, we have plenty of time tonight. Unfortunately, Sandra Gongora was unable to make it. But uh, as we mentioned, this this guy is well known in the bowling world. He's known as the backwards bowler, and he achieved an achievement that very few in bowling get to do uh, going forwards, let alone doing it the way he does. Um, Jim, welcome to the Bowler Show. Hey guys, thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Now, here's I want to talk about the first. There's there's a lot of people. I'm trying to figure out a way to phrase this because I worked with Matt Canazaro last year, and and he's told me how you understand the game. You understand, you know, the criticism and stuff like that. Um, before you get let's before we get to the 300, just talk about how you started doing this. And uh, how you handle some some of the haters in the game that that really have no place in what you know what what they're doing. Hey, it's all right. You know what? There's always going to be haters, no matter what you're doing. And the better you get, the more haters there will be. It's plain and simple. It is a sign of success. And if if you're not prepared to deal with it, well, shame on you. Like we all got to put our big boy pants on, big girl pants on, whoever you are out there, and uh, just understand that with success comes haters. And you should really actually enjoy them because that's that's kind of one of those thresholds. Once you get over it, once you start making a name for yourself, once you start doing some things that shock people, well, there's going to be haters. And so the story of how this got started is is not glamorous. And, you know, Matt probably told you it's not glamorous, but it was out with some friends one night. And I had been in a bowling alley very few times in my life. And I went with some friends that were bowlers and I was not. And a few frames in, they're giving me such a hard time. And, you know, we're young 20 somethings. So there was a few adult beverages at play as well. And obviously some testosterone, some, some male ego. And I didn't like getting razzed, but it came with the territory. And so as a joke, I threw a ball behind me and the very first ball struck. Now it wasn't pretty, but all 10 <laughs> pins went down. Yep. And instantly all of them were mad. And I thought, really, this is all I got to do to upset you guys? <laughs> and so they bet me any ball in the pro shop that a person couldn't shoot 150 bowling backwards. Wow. And it took me about six weeks. I shot 163. And by that time, I had way more games backward than I had forward. I was better backward than I was forward. And I just never turned around. And, you know, after 21 years of chasing that perfect game, uh, that came to fruition uh, about two and a half weeks ago. Yeah, I, Luke and I are both uh, ambidextrous bowlers. We both have multiple 300s uh, and 800s with our right and left hand. So we we faced a little bit of that criticism. And let, let's talk a little bit about that real quick, and then, and then we'll get rid of all the negative stuff. But uh, yeah. I'm sure you read stuff on the Internet, and, and you, these are you know keyboard warriors, whatever, but uh, how do you just go out and bowl and just enjoy your game? And, and do you do you see any of these guys in real life? Do you ever, other than proprietors that I know you've had some issues with, do you have any? Do you have anybody that's ever come up to you and said, "Hey, you know, what in the world are you doing?" And and you have to just say, "Hey, I'm, I'm bowling the way I want to bowl, and, and and I enjoy it this way, and and I score better." Yeah, you know, uh, you absolutely run into those, and that's okay because for every one of those, there's a hundred that wants to buy me a beer, that wants to have that's a awful. picture taken that, you know, this happened today. Okay. So I, I go out with my family. My son was not interested in bowling until he was part of my 300 game. And if you've seen that video, you know, it gives me a fist bump between yeah. the 11th and 12th ball. And now all of a sudden bowling's cool, but 
you know, we go out and it's my home center. So usually I can fly under the radar there. Not that I care, you know, uh, the greatest part about what I do, if you take the fact that we're having this interview, if you take about, take the TV shows and the articles and that stuff away from it, I would still want to do it because if you think about it, when you go into a bowling center, very few times, if you're a forward bowler or you're a traditional bowler, does that does that in, inspire someone to come up and talk to you? But when I go into a bowling center, it's good and bad. I can't practice mm -hmm. and you know have a bad game because then it's because I bowl backwards. Right. But you know, so I'm on stage every time I bowl, and but it it inspires people to come up and ask the question. How did that start? Oh my goodness! Can I take your picture? And so mm -hmm. today. We're at a, a at our bowling center and we're bowling a little bit and there's a group of five or six people beside us. And the guy is just geeked out of his mind and he goes, man, you don't understand. My dad used to send me pictures of you. And turns out I went to high school with his dad. Right. And he goes, can I get a picture with you? And so and so he's sending his dad a picture of, of us being at the bowling center together and then you know, something that hasn't, I didn't anticipate. And, you know, over the years, there have been some people that try it, give it a whirl, those types of things. But, you know, today there was a, a couple and, and their son bowling beside us. And, uh, you know, you could, you could tell the young man had, had some challenges, but he was there and he was having a great time. That's what bowling's all about. And he kind of looked at me and smiled and rolled one behind him. Uh -huh. And, you know, he had the bumpers up and, you know, but he had the best time and he actually ended up getting, you know, five or six pins on about the third ball. So I gave him a high five and, you know, I, I don't know if he'll ever, I don't know if he'll remember that tomorrow, but I will. Uh -huh. And that's what this sport's about. Whether you're two or 92 or 102, it doesn't matter. By God, you can get out there with your family, your friends, and you'd have a good time. One-handed, two-handed, right-handed, left-handed, forward, backwards. It's still knocking over the pins. So uh, let's take us to the night of the, the 300. Uh, your 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 bowling league, and, and I assume you're you know you're just thinking, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to shoot a good score tonight. Uh, at what point did you start thinking about it? And did you ever think during the 300, or, or or was it after when you thought, hey, this you know isn't just your normal 300. You know the guys, you know there's thousands of them every day in the United States. If, if I could shoot a 300, this one's going to be remembered. So did you think about that at all, or did you just think about your own game? Well, and so that this, this whole thing shouldn't have happened. And what I mean by that is uh, it was the city tournament. Oh. So it's on a Saturday morning. I haven't bowled the city tournament in probably a decade. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was one of my newer bowlers on my team. And he called and said, hey, you know, I'm sure you're already bowling, but I'm looking for a, a doubles partner for the city tournament. I said, man, I ain't, I ain't bowled that in at least a decade, but yeah, I'll bowl with you. And so I, that day I'd gotten a splinter in my thumb and it's just now starting to heal. And this was about a week out. I thought, you know, and it, surely in a week's time, I can get this thing, you know, back in working order. And I couldn't get the, the splinter out. And the morning of, I woke up and it was red and nasty looking. And um, so, you know, part of you wants to call and, and say, hey, I ain't going to make it. But I wasn't going to do that to him. So yeah. I told my wife, I said, I'm a, and I had just, I had an 18 gauge needle at the house. And I said, you know, I'm a, I'm going to drain it and see if I can get that, that splinter out of there and we'll see how it goes. And so, I mean, I'm basically doing surgery in, in the bathroom sink at that point. Was able to get it out, was able to get it drained, you know, put my thumb in a ball a few times. And I was like, all right, well, you know, we're good enough. And, but I was, I was in a bad mood. And my son was going with me that morning. He hardly ever is able to go because, you know, adult league, that's way past bedtime and all that. Mm -hmm. And so I had to get my mind right. And so literally in the bathroom mirror, I said, Jim, you, you got you to gotta get this together. You're either going to bowl or you're not going to bowl, but you better bring it. And because self-talk is a big thing. And, you know, some people think it's hogwash, whatever you want to call it. But I believe in it wholeheartedly. And I don't know why. But I said, today would be a good day for 300. And we headed to, we headed to the bowling center. And so Brenda Green, who has been uh, a part of youth bowling in Clarksville, Tennessee, for as long as I can remember, she was the one that checked me in that morning. 
And of course she's lively and she's like, Hey, how you doing, Jim? I see castles with you. And I said, yeah, I said, you know, it's going to be a good day. In fact, I think it's a good day for a 300. And we were joking. And if you, if she was on here, she'd tell you, Jim doesn't joke like that. And so we go over and we're a good 30 minutes early. And so I try to stretch as much as I possibly can. You know, not everybody does that, but uh, that's my thing. I want to stretch. I want to get as loose as possible. I meet the two guys that are bowling beside us and uh, they're from Ohio. And um, uh, so they're, they're down for the tournament and I said, okay, great. Well, you know, just a heads up guys, you know, I don't, I don't bowl like everybody else. And, you know, we chatted a little bit and okay. And we start bowling. And one of the things that I do is I like to record my second game. And the reason for that, and I, this is my pro tip. If you, if you ask me what, what is the number one tip that you have uh, beyond uh, getting your mind right, and that's going to be record your second game. And the reason I, I feel that way is the first game you could be, you, would, you might not be loose enough. You know, if you're like me, good, bad, or ugly, I leave my bowling balls in the car during the winter. And so, you know, they're freezing. When, when they're out, so they don't they don't quite act the same until they warm up. But second game, there shouldn't be anything in your way. You're you're not uh, you don't have an excuse to be tired yet. You should be pretty well dialed in. And then at that point, you're making tiny tweaks. If you're if your mechanics are strong, you're making tiny tweaks. And for me, because the way I bowl, I don't see the first 20 feet. I don't see what happens in the head oil. And so I record those. And so I started recording and we get to about the fifth or sixth frame. And I think the fifth frame, I came in just a little bit light. I thought, Ooh, you know, need to, need to get back on that. And so I, I, I watched the video and sure enough, uh, I came in light and said, okay. So next one, I actually over, overcorrected just a little bit and it came in just a little heavy. I thought, Ooh, I'm gonna have to back off that just a bit. And the seventh frame, I believe it is, is the one that I'm missing from the video. And it's because uh, we had a, a lane delay um, from a blackout. Yep. And so my camera just, you know, went, went back to the home screen. And so when I clicked my pen, because uh, I best practice as well, I clicked my pen on my note to start the recording. Well, it took a picture instead of recording. Oh, wow. And so I came back and, you know, that that aggravated me because, you know, it's like, <laughs> ah, you know. Um, but eighth frame, eighth frame comes around and I'm walking up and they go to call the 50, 50 ticket. And it's within just numbers of mine. And I, I'm literally going, please don't let me win. If I've got luck today, I want it here, not with money. And sure enough, it was the next ticket, like the next ticket oh, won wow. the 50, 50. And so it was the next, the next person that bought. And I said, all right, now luck's on my side. <laughs> and I was trying to figure out how to get my son over there because he was a couple lanes down. Just so happened one of his friends from school, uh, his dad was bowling as well. And my son just happened to walk up and he goes, hey, dad, can can I go play in the arcade? And I said, buddy, you can absolutely play in the arcade after you watch me throw these next four strikes. And so he, you know, popped down in the chair. He didn't, you know, he didn't know what he didn't know what he was looking at. And, uh, you know, get up there. Ninth frame. No problem. Tenth frame. First ball, all, all is well. Second ball, all is well. And I had a mental break right between the 11 and 12. So I come over and my son wants to give me a fist bump and I give him a fist bump and that didn't break me. But what broke me is when I turned around, I had just for a second in my head, I said, no matter what happens, this is going to be a great game. And then I'm glad that this did not get picked up on camera because I cussed myself and I won't use the language on here that I used to myself. I said, nope, suck it up and finish this. Show people, show your son what's possible, that what seems absolutely impossible, you can make happen. Yeah. And the 12th one was probably the best strike I threw. And I mean, it buried deep. And, you know, you hear people, you know, cheering it as it goes down the lane, get there. And, I, and there was no doubt in my mind. I knew exactly where it was. And I actually kept it together. Uh, you know, I yelled or whatever afterward, but I kept it together way better than I thought I would shoot my first three. So, you know, it was a great moment doing it there at, in front of my hometown crowd. And so many people, it was, you know, people that were there that were going to bowl the next shift and that kind of stuff for the tournament. 
it was just a great experience. And I felt bad, you know, the guys, uh, Tom and Michael Holland that were bowling with us, you know, there were a couple people that when they, when they posted the video, they said, if that was me, I'd have just picked up my stuff and walked out. And I didn't, it didn't even cross my mind, but people were talking about what they scored versus what I scored. And I, I love those guys because they didn't bother them. And usually younger bowlers, it, it gets in their head, older bowlers, not so much. And I, I really like that. Cause I don't, I don't want any be anybody to be off their game. I want everybody to do as, as good as they can. Yeah. And uh, these guys, you know, they weren't upset. They, they literally said we were just happy to be a part of history. And I had never even thought of that. Like it had never crossed my mind that that's how these guys thought about that. And so just you know, incredibly proud moment, huge that my, my son was there to share in the moment. You know, great that I was recording, great that somebody else was recording. You know, Travis, you know, there's, I think there's 430, 440,000 views wow. um, of the 10th frame. And then I've got a little over 120,000 views on, you know, the, the bulk of the game that I've got. Hammer, it's, I think it's one of their top shares for the entire year, 600 and right at 690 shares. Yep. Um, and, and I want to say thank you to everybody that has checked it out, everybody that's viewed it. I literally tried to scour the internet. And if you commented, I responded. Whether you said good things or bad things, you know, yep. I, I appreciate people checking it out. Well, there's a lot to unpack there because a lot of people you know, have gotten to the point where, you know, where you're at, but just in, in a different way. I mean, I, I guess one thing I want to know personally is, you know, not even just in the 300, but, you know, we had Fred Borden on, and I kind of said something to him about, Hey, you know, what, 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 how in the world would you tackle uh, this guy's game? Because it's something I'm sure he's never, never done before. Mm -hmm. But the obvious questions are, you know, stuff like, Hey, are, are, you know, have you ever just walked over the foul line? Uh, obviously most bowlers that bowl forward, you know, I, I don't, nobody thinks about the foul line. You've done it so many mm -hmm. thousands of times. You, you're not yeah. going to foul most every time. So, uh, I mean, what's the thought process? Do you, when you walk up there, I, I seen the video, but I didn't really break it down. Tell, sure. tell us your, your thought process. When you walk up there, you pick an out a spot on the, on the board and then what's, what's next? What's in your mind? Hey, I got to start walking backwards. What is it just natural now? Or are there things you have to think about? No, no, it's all natural now. And the hardest thing I took right at three years. I mean, if you look, look me up on USBC, I've got, uh, I've got three years there, 20, I guess, 2017, 2018, 2019, where, you know, I was basically a sub. I didn't really bowl. We, we got crazy at work and we're growing. Uh, we were national's fastest growing company for, uh, two, two different years. And, um, you know, we grew from six million dollars to a little over a hundred million dollars, and that took. You know, I was working 60, 70 hours a week, so we were in that type of situation. I had to call my guys, and I've been on the same team for twenty plus years, um, almost since I started bowling. And I called my guys, and I said, I, "You're going to need to find somebody. I'm going to be working like crazy." And sure enough, you know, if I if I was able to sub, I was excited. And so, you know, didn't get to see Matt at USBC uh, at, at the Open uh, for several years. Yeah. And I didn't realize how hard it would be to come back from that. It was insanely difficult for me to come back from three years of, you know, I, I pretty well lost my muscle memory. And it was disheartening to come back in, I think, 2020, mm -hmm. uh, 2020, 2021. You know, I bowled, um, I think I had a 180 something average. And then got back over 200 last year. And so, but still didn't feel good about it. And, and honestly, right now, even today, I was a better bowler. I was, a, well, my physical game was stronger. I could do more with the bowling ball in 2009 than I can today. But my mental game is 10x what it was back then. Right. And I, I think some of that just comes with personal growth. But my mental game is dialed in. Now, you know, everybody's got an off day or whatever, but like I didn't even, I didn't even shake. And I don't know, I don't know how anybody else's body works, et cetera. But, you know, when I've gotten close before, because I've got, I think, 13 279s, a 289, wow. you know, and I usually get, 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 get the shake in that right hand. And it didn't even, it didn't even present. I, I knew exactly what I needed to do. But, uh, yeah, it's, 
you got to have your mechanics down or you can't make tiny tweaks. And uh, what Fred said is, is spot on. And, you know, kind of this process started about two months ago because uh, I'm sure you guys know Ron Hickland uh, over at CTD. And, you know, he's, he's a great guy. I've known him ever since he was at Ebonite. And I called him. We were chatting about something and uh, I took some stuff by, by the warehouse up there and I said, hey, I need some help. And he goes, what? And I said, man, I need to get dialed in. I want to shoot three before the end of the year. And he goes, absolutely. What, whatever it takes, let's do it. And we we kind of missed each other back and forth. And then I bowled the city tournament and shot three. Mm-hmm. But I, I think you got to you got to you got to make it known, you know, all the things just kind of lined up for, for me to shoot three that day. But, you know, it, your mental game's got to be there. Your mechanics have got to be there. You can't make a micro adjustment. If you're not already dialed in on mechanics, it, I mean, and I think that's I think that's one thing that people don't quite understand about the guys that are they're bowling like crazy on on tour. I mean, those guys are making just the smallest adjustments yeah. Yeah. in real time and and crushing it. And, and and that's the difference. That's the difference between bowling league or bowling a city tournament and somebody at that level bowling live on TV. And, you know, I've, I've bowled my fair share of live uh, stuff, but uh, it's a whole different thing when that camera's rolling. That's another that's another reason why I say best practice is to get that camera rolling is yeah. it increases my heart rate. So uh, sometimes I'll wear a heart monitor. I know that seems that seems probably a little out, outside of the norm for people, but I am not I'm not inside the norm anyway. <laughs> but I'll wear a heart monitor while bowling and I can tell which games I've got the video rolling and which games I don't because my heartbeat is about 15 beats a minute faster when wow. I'm uh, when I'm recording. And I think that's a best practice because it it kind of it minimizes the jump for me between I'm chilled out and I'm maxed out. And so I'm already closer to that maxed out. So there's not that that rush that, you know, would throw you off your game. Uh, one thing I'm curious about is your your ball drilling and especially uh, your thumb pitches. What is yeah. Do you know uh, what's what's going on with that? Is that, uh, you have it specially drilled to your so you're able to come out of it uh, coming from the angle that you do? Absolutely. So you know all of that. You know I wasn't a bowler. I didn't know how to bowl, much less how to bowl backwards. That you know when when I tackled this, it was all trial and error. I was beating my head against the wall, and so for probably a year, I actually brought my hand backward. And so the ball was spinning backwards going down the lane. It was fighting me. I wasn't rolling the ball. And uh, I mean, it took, I mean, even if you, if you look online right now, if you, if you see all the people out there trying to roll the ball, uh, their hands on the wrong side of the ball there, they haven't figured out yet that in that ups in the forward swing, you got to turn your hand over on top of the ball so that you can roll it. Hmm. And uh, so it's it's drilled like a lefty, yeah. But I've got a different pitch on that thumb so that I can get out, because you, if that thumb doesn't come out first, you, yeah. you can forget it. You're not rolling the ball. Um, so it was all trial and error. And then, um, uh, well, I've got one right here. So this is this is the 300 ball, uh, my Black Widow. But uh, I use an index finger, and of course that's an oddity. Nobody nobody uses an index <laughs> finger, um, but. You know, backwards bowling is is not for everybody, and I, I pretty well break all the rules. So, uh, you know, it's it's just one of those things, trial and error, and that's what gets me there. That's not to say that that's the end all be all, but there's not anybody else out there that's got as many hours on the lane working on this craft as as I do. And um, you know, I, I joke with with Brian Graham; he's a great guy over at, over at Brunswick, and uh, of course, he knew I shot 300 within seconds of me shooting 300. And he said, was it with the Black Widow? And I said, yeah. I said, you know, I had to wait for you to come out with the 2.0 for me to shoot 300 <laughs> because my world record at 278 was shot during a, a Fox uh, Fox interview with oh, wow. the original Black Widow. And so fast forward, you know, whatever it is, uh, 16 years from then, and now we've got 300 with the Black Widow 2.0. Well, let's let's take it a step further. You know, you you've got people saying, "Hey, you you know, you're never going to shoot 150. You're never going to do this. You're never going to shoot 300." 
uh, what's next? Do you have any aspirations of, uh, you know, bowling, maybe not necessarily on the PBA tour, but, uh, uh, where do you go from here? So 2011, I actually got my PBA card and it was one of those things, you know, um, you may know this, you may not know this. So back in 2006, 2007, all the way up to 2009, uh, Matt and them at USBC, they put on what was called bowl fest. And Matt called me out of the blue. I remember exactly where I was standing. I was standing in a, in a customer's house and Matt called and he goes, Hey, what are you doing in February? I, said, I don't know. What, what do you want me to be doing in February? And he goes, I want you to come out here and bowl with Bob Learn and Dale Nemola. And you know, you guys are going to put on a trick shot show. I said, well, I mean, count me in. I've never been a part of anything like that, but I'll, I'll come. And uh, Bob learned, I mean, probably my favorite bowler, period. And Bob, I, what I love about Bob is Bob does not cut me any slack, but he, I feel like he treats me like everybody else. Right. And so we get out there and we're bowling. And he goes, so what other trick shots you got? And I said, Bob, I don't, I don't have trick shots. This is how I bowl. And it was because, you know, so many people, you know, I got called a mockery of the sport. Um I won't name a name, but a a bowler that is just synonymous with bowling, period, refused to bowl with me at Expo one time. And I was a, I was a young bowler. I mean, I, I, I'd, I'd been bowling maybe three years and they asked me to bowl at Expo. And when I threw the first ball, he threw his ball in his bag and said, not with me, you don't. And he walked out and I was I was crushed. I mean, it destroyed me. <laughs> and Chris Barnes is an absolute rock star in my book. You know what, Chris, Chris looked over at me, he goes, out of heck with that. He's like, let's bowl. And we bowled right there in Expo and just, just a blast of a time. But I always took myself very seriously because I didn't want to be considered a mockery of the sport. And when I was bowling with Bob, Bob goes, Jim, every tour player that's worth his salt is, has got trick shots in his bag. And I took that to heart. So I practiced every trick shot I could come up with. And so each year we did bowl fest and the, the pinnacle of, of what I've done in bowling, maybe even my 300, it might capsize that as well. Now in 2009, we were in Las Vegas and bowl fest was during the masters. And so you had all, everybody that earns their living in bowling, is there watching and we put on a trick shot show yeah. so myself bob learn brian voss uh carmen servino um uh, deandra i mean it was there was a whole slew of uh, um carolyn doran ballard dell ballard i mean so i'm i'm out of place and, and i was really out of place at all of those events because i was the only one that wasn't a pba star or a hall of famer and that's why i wanted to get my card is because you know every time we did an autograph session that, oh, you're a Hall of Famer. No. <laughs> oh, you're, a, you're you're on the tour. No, I'm not either with one of those things. I'm the oddball. I'm the guy that's not supposed to be here. And in 2009, so it was a weird event because uh, they had a an opening act. And, and again, I won't say anything uh, bad about the opening act, but the uh, the manager for that opening act came down and they said, if you throw a bowling ball, now we were 80 lanes away, you know, at, at, at that center. And they said, if you throw a, a bowling ball, we're walking out. So we go live with trick shots cold. Yep. And the first three trick shots. And if you've ever been to it, I mean, you think about Dude Perfect. Well, this was Dude Perfect before Dude Perfect was a thing. <laughs> and you don't go to see trick shots tried. Yep. You go to see the magic. You go to see the things that just don't even seem possible <laughs> done right before your eyes. And the first three trick shots, and we're talking about by Hall of Famers and by PBA superstars, were missed. Mm. And Tom Clark comes over and he goes, hey, Jim, no, no pressure or anything, but <laughs> we're looking to you. Save it. I said, okay. <laughs> and so I go up there and we trick shot after trick shot after trick shot, did every single one of them. And I got really lucky. So, you know, Fred was talking about uh, the bowling gods looking down. Well... I had that happen that day. Mm -hmm. So it was Brian Voss, Bob Learn, and myself. We were throwing a three ball shot. They were going to cross. I was going to go in between. Oh, wow. 5 7 10. And so, you know, timing had to be perfect. Everything had to be perfect. 
and I let go of the ball and because there, they, there was a tournament shot out and they told us, they were like, guys, you know, we put the wrong shot out. You're just going to have to deal with it. Yeah. And so the tournament shot was out and man, I whiffed the five pin like nobody's business, but the balls hit each other in the back and two balls bounced back out on the lane and hit the pin. And they thought it was the best trick shot that anybody had ever seen. That's and awesome. so the, the crowd's going nuts. And as we go to high five, um, Brian Voss, we missed each other. And literally his hand, he poked me in the eye. <laughs> and so my eyes all watering and, and whatnot. And um, Tom Clark comes over and he goes, cool. So what, what's, the, what's the big finish? And I'm out of tricks. I mean, I had a ramp shot. I had a through the chair shot. I had, I mean, out of the towel, you, you name it. We'd, we'd all thrown everything we, th we knew to throw. And Carmen's over there doing an MC. You know, he's, he's, he's the right guy for that. He's, I love him. He's, he's awesome. And uh, Tom, or not Tom, but Bob goes, I've got it. And I'm like, what are you going to do, Bob? He goes, no, it's what you're going to do. I'm like, okay, what do you want me to do? He goes, we're going to set up two different chairs. I'm like, I don't do two chairs. I do one chair. And he goes, <laughs> oh, it'll be fine. And so he sets two chairs up about 20 feet apart on the lane. And so he's going to sit in one. Dell Ballard's going to sit in the other one. So I got to throw it between two Hall of Famers feet Boy. and make a strike. And this has not been practiced. Now, one thing you need to know about me is I love pressure. I thrive. Like, if you want me to go big, well, by God, throw a thousand people watching me. <laughs> and so I did the only thing I could think of to make sure that I would make it. So I walk over and I ask Carmen for the mic. And of course, he looks at me like I am nuts. He's <laughs> like, you're not the MC. I said, this is it. And I said, hey, guys, so here's the thing. This has never been tried. I've never tried it. I'm the only person on the planet that would try it. Bob just set it up and I don't want to hit either one of these guys. They're both hall of famers. So <laughs> here's the deal. If I, if I hit either one of them, I want you to boo me out of this place. Like I don't belong. But if I go through both those chairs and I make that strike, I want you to be on your feet, just raising all kinds <laughs> and give the mic back to Carmen, walk over there through both chairs. Didn't hit either one of them. Perfect pocket wow. strike. And they go nuts. <laughs> and for me, like I say, it's probably tied. Maybe it might even still be higher than my 300 because it was just to have everybody there that I've watched on TV, that I've admired, that, you know, that I should be watching them. They were there watching me. And I, I felt like I was, you know, on cloud nine. That's good stuff here. I, I'm, I'm going to turn it over to my partner here and see what, see what he's got here for you. But uh, before I do it, you know, I just want to say I love your attitude, man. It's it's uh, I I have trouble just with uh, anybody hating on me because, like I said, I I throw right, I throw left, and people who know just like today when I bowl the tournament, I throw a lot of spares. Yeah, uh, I throw a backup ball, and Luke knows this. Um, I the percentages on a three six or a ten pin or whatever are exponentially in my favor of throwing it and I, and I can throw it and control it. And every once in a while I get somebody come up, you know, Hey, what are, what are you doing? I'm like, well, what, what do you think I'm doing that? Well, you quit goofing around. I'm like, you know, you've heard this a million times on centers and I'm like, no, I'm doing this the way I want to in the way that I think is best. So yeah. um, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you on the way out, but let's, uh, let's turn it over here to Luke. And Absolutely. Uh, in a twist of fate, Luke's actually going to do this interview backwards. It's, it's uh, been requested by most of our <laughs> yeah, fans. Yeah. I like it. No, 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 I've been uh, I've been browsing his uh, his YouTube channel here while while I've been uh, behind the behind the wall here. So you do all kinds of stuff, <laughs> like <laughs> like it's it's not just a bunch of bowling videos on your channel. You got all kinds of stuff going on. So what what I mean, the bowling thing is uh, kind of your claim to fame, I guess. But what all kinds of other stuff you got going on? Well, you know. Um... I, I'm one of those guys. I did, I did a podcast the other day, and he said, "Man, it looks to me like you go 100 on everything." Yeah, yeah. And that and that's really who I am. And I'm not trying to I'm not trying to pub myself up. It's just the best way to describe me. I have trouble, and some people will relate to this. Some people won't. It's okay. I have trouble distinguishing between who I am and what I do. Mm -hmm. And so when it comes to bowling, I'm all in, and and I am I am the backwards bowler. You know, the yeah. backwards bowler was 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 available. No, I am the backwards bowler. Mm -hmm. And you know, when it comes to business, 
You know, there's not, there's, I mean, don't get me wrong. There's plenty of people out there that have grown big, grown big businesses, but I grew a business from $6 million to over a hundred million dollars. Mm -hmm. And I grew a team from 32 to over, over 400, almost 500. Yeah. And, you know, if you go on LinkedIn, some of my best LinkedIn, LinkedIn recommendations are literally by people that I had to fire. Oh yeah. But it's because, because it's, it's how you handle things, uh -huh. you know, if you handle things with respect, like people can get sideways with me and you know what, don't get me wrong. You push me far enough. I might get sideways too, but as much as I possibly can, I'm going to take the high road. You know, a lot of people that on my video that, you know, there was, there were some people out there that said, you're a mockery to the sport. You should stop. You're bad for our game. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know what, man, I'm sorry. You're having a bad day. I'm sorry. You quit believing in bowling, but I haven't. Bowling is strong. And if you go out and you watch these youth bowlers and you go watch them throw two handed and you see how excited they get when they shoot high scores, well, by God, you know, you know that our future has a, has, has a future or our sport has a future. Yeah. And I'm sorry that you can't see that. I'm sorry that your prejudice is so thick or the glasses that you're looking through are so thick with disdain or hate or bad experiences that you can't see the positive. Another good uh, best practice I'll tell you guys. Um, I've only seen the news twice in eight years. <laughs> I don't watch the news. I don't mm -hmm. let it in my world. I don't let negativity in. It's hard enough to stay positive all the time. If, if you're not watching CNN or whatever, whatever, wherever you get your news, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's just don't let it in your world. And then, you know, I, when 2020 uh, came to be, I led my team and then, uh, ownership decided to sell the company. And so I parted ways and I took the time I built our dream home. So my wife and I saved for 12 years and we'd already bought the land. And, you know, I took the time and said, all right, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna build it. And I'd never built a home before. And so I self-contracted and, <laughs> oh yeah. You know, the, well, yeah, it's all, it's all the videos Those are kind of interesting for everybody to go check those out. Yeah. So my architect told me, he goes, Jim, he goes, what you're trying to build, nobody's ever built. He goes, they don't build it for a reason. I said, I don't care. He goes, well, man, there's Craftsman Farmhouse. There's Farmhouse uh, Lodge. He goes, there's no such thing as a Craftsman Farmhouse Lodge. Don't build this. <laughs> and I said, well, I'm pretty sure I told you what I wanted. And I gave you the plans. And it's up to you to make sure that I got something to go build. And so I did. And it took me, I mean, it took me longer than most people. It took me 21 months to build it. But we'll be here forever. I mean, it's hey. our dream home. And most people wouldn't attack that. Most people wouldn't attack that. They just wouldn't. Um, and I'm not mad at them. It's, it was hard. Um, probably wouldn't do it again, but it was one heck of an experience. And that's what I can say about bowling. That's what I say about business. I help, you know, I'm a, I'm an owner in a firm now and, you know, we're consultants, we help people grow. And sometimes you have to have that tough conversation. I had a conversation with a client not too long ago and I said, are you, are you ready to grow? And they said, yes. And I said, you're not. And of course, you know, we're talking to the CEO mm -hmm. and he goes, um, no, we are. And I said, cool. So, uh, let's pick up the phone and call anybody in your organization and ask them if we're in a growth mode. And he goes, well, why does that matter? I said, if every person here does not know the mission and the fact that we are in growth mode, then we are not in growth mode. We have missed that communication. So they have no idea. They have no idea what their role is in it. They have no idea how to support it. We're not going to win that way. And I mean, that's just, that's the way I look at life is whatever you got on your table, whatever you're ready to do, like when you're ready, you'll take the steps in order to get it done. And whether that's building a house, whether that's setting out to uh, get your PBA card, whether that is to shoot 300, whether it's to grow a business, whether it's to raise your family the right way, it doesn't matter what it is. You'll, if, if it's important enough to you, you'll make the time and you'll make, you put in the effort to get it done. I, uh, it's kind of funny. I complain to my wife all the time about how busy we are, but I'm kind of the same way. If I'm going to do something, like I don't know how to do something just to kind of casually enjoy it. Like I, I don't go out to just, well, I'm just going to go bowl. I'm just going to go hang with everybody and whatever. And <laughs> and I'm like, no, if I'm going to go bowl, I'm going to go bowl. Or if I'm going to do this, I'm, I'm going to do it. The enjoyment is in the succeeding at it, not necessarily I, it, just the participation thing kind of kind of drives me nuts. But again, that may you're busy all the time. And so then I complain about how busy we are before getting myself back into something else that ends up making me busier than than I should have been because I turned it. I've got to, you know, I've got to, I've got to win. I've got to conquer it. 
Um, oh yeah. I get what you're talking about too, from the, uh, from the angle of, you know, people being negative about stuff. Cause the only reason that anybody knows who I am is because I put bowling ball videos on YouTube. And of course that's the, there, there's a whole other, there's a whole other stigma about that too. And I fight the, I fight the staffer label and the, you know, well, what have you ever done? What tournaments have you won? Are you a coach or whatever else you put bowling ball videos on YouTube? And I'm like, I mean, People say they're pretty good, though. So I mean, <laughs> if, I, if you're if you're providing value, who cares? I mean, again, it's a hater that's that's hating on you because you're doing something they're not, or you're doing something better and they're envious. And so, uh, yeah, you you should be glad that they're out there. And that's something that took me. That's something that actually took me a while to realize is that I thought that if you did all the right things the right way, that you would have like more supporters. And it's kind of it's kind of the opposite. It's all, it's almost like if you're doing something interesting or different, like you, I mean, you know this very well, if you're doing something interesting or different or you care about it or whatever, all, all kinds of people come out of the woodwork to be negative about it for some reason. And I, I don't, I don't understand. I don't see anything negative about what you're doing. I think it's really cool. It's interesting. It gets attention. I mean, you talked about all these, all these things that you've done because you throw a ball backwards and that that gets bowling on the on the national stage really and uh, opens up you've had all kinds of experiences just because you throw throw a bowling ball different and it's yeah. I, I think it's great yeah what what bowling has given me is is priceless it really is you know i've i've been all over the world uh you know doing live tv doing recorded tv doing trick shot shows we, we did one for uh, make a wish foundation up in pittsburgh years ago i mean just I've been all over the place. And to me, I feel like I'm just getting started. Honestly, it, it people, you know, everybody's like, Oh my gosh, you shot 300. So you've made it I'm like, no, I, I want another one. I want it quick. And I want to shoot <laughs> yeah, eight, yeah. Uh -huh. you know? Yeah. And you know, it, it's all about what drives you. And, you know, if you're not excited about life, I, I feel, I feel bad for you. Don't, don't get me wrong. Everybody has, there's, there's waves, right? You know, there's high points and low points. But you got to make the most of the high ones and you got to get out of the low ones as fast as you possibly can. And so, you know, st I started a business a uh, year before last and it didn't work. And so that was painful, you know, having had as much success as I've had. And I started a business and it didn't work. But at the same time, once once you realize it hasn't worked. All right. What, what's your next move? What, get on with it. You got one life to live. I mean, don't dwell in the past. Like, like let's get on with it. <laughs> And all too often we, we throw ourselves a pity party or, you know, fill in the blank. Um, and, and I'll tell you, losing early has driven me. And I, I told this story not long ago. So in 2003, the day before I bowled at Expo, um, I, so this was probably my third year in bowling and I won the handy or uh, sorry, I didn't win. I was number two in tennis, the Tennessee tournament in the handicap side. And I won a side pot and the side pot was you went to Vegas to bowl against the other 50 state winners wow. for a new Cadillac. Oh, okay. And they, it was a different tournament and they give you a number and you got to bowl that number without going over and with no gutter balls. <laughs> and so I went out there and I tied, there was three of us that tied. And so in the last game, I was the last one to bowl. All I needed was a five, six or seven. And I had practiced coming in light just in case I needed that. Because in order to tie the previous game, I had to pick off the 10 pin and then go back through the hole oh, no. and did it. But, yeah. you know, it was one of those things like, oh, my gosh, we're here. And so I, I was like, all right, I can do this five, six or seven. And I choked. <laughs> I threw it straight down the middle and it was a strike. And you're disqualified because I went over and I was just i was furious mm -hmm. but this young lady ran up and she goes congratulations and i said what do you what do you mean i just lost <laughs> like, it was mine to win and i lost it and she goes oh i'm sorry i didn't realize that i'm like okay and she goes but we want you to bowl at expo tomorrow and of course i i mean this was so long ago this was 2003 i didn't even know what expo was and she goes no no it's with some hall of famers chris barnes will be there and i'm like okay and so you know i bowl expo the next day but you know, I could have absolutely just been stuck in my head and I could have said no. I could have gone over there and been, you know, I could have just beat myself up. And but you can't you can't dwell on that. So, 
get like I say, get through the get through the bad moments as fast as you possibly can. Get on with the good ones. And, you know, on the hater side of things, I don't necessarily pay attention to how many haters I have. I pay attention to to who is there cheering me on. And so, I mean, I, I'm a huge Tom Clark fan. I mean, he's it, periodically he'll send me something and be like, oh, oh, found another backwards bowler or, you know, something like that. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, uh, uh, Tom Clark, I just, I mean, he's a, he's, he's a rock star. Bob Learn, again, probably my favorite bowler to bowl with. Um, had, had a great time. I mean, this was, this was actually 10 years ago last week or, well, 10 years ago this week. Um, Johnny Petraglia and I were hired by Disney to be the trick shots and, you know, to, to do all the fanfare for the launch of the first Disney bowling alley oh, there yeah. in, uh, there in Orlando. Uh-huh. And, uh, it was a surreal experience because, uh, and maybe the hardest bowling I've ever had because, you know, I'm staring at a spot on the lane. You asked that question earlier, kind of, what are you looking at? I'm just like you guys line up on the lane. I'm lining up on the lane and I'm staring at a spot, you know, in front of me, like you stand there at a spot in front of you. But the cameraman needed to walk with me. So my spot was through him. (laughs) And if you're trying to see a spot through somebody (laughs) and they're three feet in front of you with a camera, that's tough. Yeah. And, you know, the way Good Morning America works, because I've been on Good Morning America twice. And the way they work is, I mean, they tell you exactly what they want and when you've got to do it. Uh And so it comes down there like you're going to go live. We need a strike and eight seven oh, six no. <laughs> you know and then they give you the go yeah and knock on wood i've done it both times but you talk about pressure i mean oh yeah <laughs> those cats put some pressure on you for sure but it's yeah. it's so much fun that's that's why i like bowling that's why i like business that's why i like helping people grow their business uh that's why i love you know uh watching my son play basketball and and, and raising him is because when you see people grow when you see people do things that they couldn't do yesterday when, when you see those types of things happen, that, I mean, that just, that, that warms my heart and my soul. It's fantastic. Mm. All right, Jim, let's, uh, Luke and I's wives are probably putting the pressure on us to get to wrap this up and, and yeah, get yeah. to our respective dinners. So, uh, obviously we have as much time as we want to do on here, but we need to, we need to go ahead and wrap this up. I, I just wanted to say that I, I love the way you handle it, even more impressed, uh, with that than the actual feet for me. Uh, like I said, Luke and I aren't impressed. Well, as soon as you can do this uh, with your other hand backwards, then we'll be impressed. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna leave that to on you guys. Serious <laughs> note, not on a serious note, it's 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 uh, for me. It's more the way that that you handle it because I'm not sure that if I got on the internet and and people were talking bad, I'd be like, oh, yeah, let's see you do it, or you know, I'm not sure I'd handle it the, the same way with such grace. And and that's what impresses me even more than the feet. Well, the number one thing that I tell people is. You know, I'll, I'll address it and I'll say, I'm sorry, you have a bad day or, you know, fill in the blank with whatever it is. Um, but I'll still cheer you on when you shoot your three. And, you know, most people, it's, you know, that's it's over and done at that point. And, you know, I had a couple of people that responded back and even responded on some YouTube channels out there saying that they snapped at me kind of negative. And then when I responded, because I responded to every comment I could find, mm-hmm. good, bad or ugly. And we're talking about thousands of comments. Yeah. yeah. And, um, you know, they were like, you know, I, I was, I responded kind of snappy at him. And then he responded and was so nice to me that I, I had to respond back to him and, and apologize. Yeah. And, you know, I, again, I, I just, I want everybody to be the best they can possibly be. And if you're being negative, you're, you're not your best self, plain and simple. And I know that that sounds, you know, way too sunshine and and rainbows, but I'm, I'm a firm believer that there's so many people out there doing amazing, awesome things that it's pointless to try to tear somebody down or to spend time being negative. And so, you know, get off that train and, and, you know, to your, to your wife's point, you know, they they want positivity from us, you know, and everybody does. Nobody, I mean, unless you're just, you know, trying to get people to, you know, whine with you, uh, (laughs) get, get on your soapbox and be loud about being happy. And be proud. Well, and that'll that'll lift other people up. The the guy in front of you, Fred Borden, Hall of Fame coach, um, said the exact same words. You know, that's yeah. that's what he talked about. Was you know, it, it's it's easier for you know, it's easy to tell people, hey, you got you you know, stay positive. That's better than being negative. And 
And, you know, Luke or I, you know, we bowl, we've been negative on the bowling lanes before, and we know we're not at our best when we do that. So uh, it's tough to work on. But anyway, Jim, I just want to thank you very much for coming on uh, this Sunday night. I know we had you scheduled for another night. It didn't work out. Uh, Luke and I, we've got so much going on in the bowling world. But uh, your story is great, and and the way you handle it is great. And and I really appreciate you spending the time here tonight on the Bowler Show. Absolutely. I want to say thank you to you guys. And I also want to say thank you to the, the guys that have supported me so long. I mean, you know, Brian Graham at Brunswick Hammer. Oh, my gosh. Those guys, you know, they, they stuck with me even even when I wasn't doing, you know, I wasn't making their equipment looking good. And, you know, Ron over at CTD, uh, Tom and the PBA, everybody at USBC, you know, Matt, Matt's been just a He's a he's he's an, an unbelievable individual, and I know you know him, so uh, you guys know that all too well. But you know the people that are in bowling that 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 put this on, and that you know the proprietors that work their tails off to give us a wonderful place to bowl when you know people are trying to snap up their real estate, and they yeah. could turn a quick buck, and they could they could retire to a beach, but they come in there and they slug it out to provide a place for kids to learn how to bowl for families to come and have a good time with each other and for league bowlers to, to come in and either have fun or hone their craft. And I'm just thankful for all those people. And uh, I, I, there's, this is my ask for everybody. Take your family bowling this holiday season, have a good time. Even if it's, even if it's a, a relative that you don't really like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, bury the hatchet, take them bowling, have a good time. And if nothing else, you know, you spend some time on the lane. Guys, thanks so much for having me on. Yeah, this was this was great. All right, Jim, great stuff. We uh, we will take that to heart. You have a good night, and we'll uh, we'll look forward to what what happens next in, in bowling for you here real soon. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, good deal. Right. Thanks, guys. Have a good yeah. evening. Yeah, All right, thank thank you. you. Even even the three hundred on his pin is backwards. Luke, did you see that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I have a feeling he did that intentionally. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> yeah. That's good stuff. We should have probably done that, uh, the whole interview backwards, but I think that would have been pushing it. But, you know, seriously, he, he handles it great. I'm not sure um, that I would handle it as good as he does and, and everything, you know, that I've seen. He, he does a great job with uh, being an ambassador for the sport, and we know we need more people like him. Yeah. All right. Uh, you got anything else here? I know we talked about an announcement earlier, and then uh, Fred Borden goes and says something like that and makes you uh, wonder if you're doing – the right thing. But anyway, th- those of you who kind of know what I'm talking about, um, we'll, we'll make an announcement on the next show, which is going to be a while. Uh, yeah. Luke and I have some stuff going on next weekend. And then, of course, for two weeks, we'll have the holidays. So, uh, Luke, you got anything else here for our possible uh, penultimate show, whatever you want to call it? Uh, not really. And I suppose it's a it's a good thing that we're busy enough with with bowling stuff to you know, you got uh, the tournaments have been exceptionally successful and uh, the YouTube thing for me is still growing and going. And I've got, you know, just too busy with bowling stuff. So that's I don't think that that's that's having so much success. You don't have the time for it all is not a bad thing, I don't think. So, yeah. All right. Well, we'll we'll, uh, we'll talk about uh, we'll talk about. Uh, that a little more next week um actually uh, you're the you're the you're the man behind the tech stuff there i see if uh, you can see what jim is typing there if you yeah, yeah. Uh, do that uh, i'm you i'm sure you're all over that and you'll you'll be getting that on there there you go right there yeah so if you guys get a chance you see in the chat there luke has included a uh link to uh jim's backward bowler the at the backward bowler there after youtube.com slash uh, that's it actually there there it is just click yeah. on it and uh it, like like luke said there's some good stuff on there it's not, i i didn't know anything about the trick shots i didn't know anything about uh some of the other stuff that he's done i knew he was on mm-hmm. tv and local i didn't know he's on good morning america so uh great yeah, stuff uh, yeah and there's like i said there's i was i was browsing while you were talking to him i was i was browsing his youtube channel there's, there's all kinds of different stuff on there so that's why i asked him it seems like he i mean <laughs> He built built the house, and he's got all kinds of other motivational videos on there, and all kinds of successes and whatever else. And so I'm like, yeah, that's just a that's just a good channel to check out and sub to. Yeah, he's got a great attitude. You know, he's gonna stay positive with anything that he does, and he's probably gonna 
be successful uh, sans the other business he was talking about. But anyway, Luke, we uh, we thought we might wrap this show up around 7.30 tonight since Sandra wasn't able to make it, but uh, yeah, it gave okay. us some time to talk to our guests here a lot, uh, a lot more. So once again, we want to thank all of our sponsors, of course, our title sponsor, Storm Bowling. Uh, we want to thank Coolwick Turbo, I Am Bowling, uh, SRG BBFS, Storm Roto Grip Bowling Balls for Sale, with the hashtag in front of it, on Facebook. Mm -hmm. Uh, of course, uh, BobbyJacksons.com, one of our original sponsors, along with Double J's Pro Shop, uh, SNH Custom Homes, and Bowler's Mart. I always forget Bowler's Mart for some reason. So, <laughs> anyway, uh, we can't do it without our sponsors. We appreciate how they've kind of stuck through uh, our, our, my years, especially uh, over the years of uh, when I started 2014. Uh, some of these people have been on board ever ever since that time. So uh anyway luke you got anything else uh, you want to put a bow on this nope i'm good to go i'm gonna go get me some uh get me some chow and take a nap <laughs> <laughs> sounds good all right guys once again thank you very much for listening to the bowler show and and this was a fun one and uh hope, hopefully everybody enjoyed it so uh we will see you uh on january 8th yeah